listening to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. And we are back. Welcome back, guys, to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. It is the only podcast in the whole world that brings the firehouse kitchen table to you. And that table is, in fact, a table that holds the weight of a thousand stories. Everything occurs at the kitchen table. We have a very special guest tonight. We are honored. Huge the goat. Prob- probably uh, the most world-renowned name in firefighting in the world. Uh, but before that, Pete, let's get the Pledge of Allegiance out of the way. Let's get all patriotic and um, get all to right. it, buddy. All right. Well, here we go, ladies and gentlemen, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well done, right. Pete. Well done. Let's get right into the quick little spiel we got so we can get right to the guest. Yeah, very very much uh, a quick spiel tonight, guys. As you all know, we are we lost sponsored. Him, right? <laughs> oh, there he's gone. Oh, he's, back. He's, he's, back. he's back. He's back. He's back. <laughs> all right. So, so uh, getting salty apparel.com, guys. That's how we pay the bills around here. I'll leave it at that. You guys know what we're all about. Great t-shirts, firefighter apparel, and accessories. But also, guys, the super <laughs> chat. If you guys absolutely positively have a question that you need answered tonight please hit us up in the super chat we'll only be answering questions tonight from the super chat also guys please make your questions relevant uh if you uh, you know we're in the middle of a fire story uh, let's just say the famed 23rd street fire and you ask me if uh chief dunn here knows tommy smith from ladder 44217 <laughs> i'm gonna freak out and i'm gonna crap all over your super chat and return you your money so there it is Ask relevant questions. We love you guys. And that is all. Go ahead, great. Guys. Chief, Chief, it is a great honor to have you on the show. Uh, like I said there, before. Baby. Hey, there clap. he is. There he is. And we are going to minimize. Probably. There is no word of the day and there is no real sound effects tonight. Chief, have- Chief, you know, yeah, I, I, have to hit, I have to hit you with this because I Go hit all the, all the young guys. You know, we're happy you finally came on the show because uh, we don't know how much longer you got. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. I'm glad to be on. <laughs> Wait, did you see? Did Believe you see me, how fat, he was I, like a cat, bro? Did you see him run uh, to the, chair, the table over there? Oh yeah, he's yeah. Like, I know. Come on, he's nimble. How old, Chief? How old are you now? I'm I'm 86 years old, going on 87 in May, and like I used to say, I'm in the two minute warning. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Actually, I'm even further. I'm in the. Sudden death period. <laughs> ah, you got another hundred ah, to go. Good. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. not. Yeah. But uh, I'm feeling good. God's been good to you're me. You're looking great. You look you're great. Great. Good. Yeah, you good know, genes. I'm God and my father. That's what I I always nice. thank every morning I wake up. Those two people get the first two. Thanks. Sweet. All right. So you know what? With that said, <laughs> we're gonna jump right into your father because uh, the chief okay. was kind enough to send me a copy of his My War Years: A Fire Chief's Memoir. Before it's even out, so I kind of have a, a, a rough outline of the chief's entire career and his life story. So I'm going to lead him in with this one, Chief. Tell us about your dad, and tell us about your very first uh, experience to fire when uh, your, your mom was okay. on the mattress and the bed caught fire. Give okay. us that story. So I'm 10 years old. I'm sound asleep, and I hear Vin get water. My father shouts. Vin, get what? I jump out of bed <clears throat> at the same time that <clears throat> my father whips the comforter off my mother and sparks and flame are all over the room. I'm standing there with the with the, with the pre-flesh over stuff. So I run out to the kitchen <laughs> and there's a funny. pot of a pressure cooker, pot of remnants from pea soup my mother was cooking earlier. So it was full. I bring it in. My father... Had taken my mother off the mattress. He pours the oh my the whole God. thing of pea soap on the mattress, <laughs> and he grabs the uh, the springs in the mattress. He drags the mattress out the door. 
into the, into the street. He hooks it on the back of his 37 Chevy and <laughs> drives down the street, flames <laughs> to the nearby lot, and he dumps it in the lot, and he comes back. And then my mother was burned. She had burns, third-degree burns, but oh she didn't God. want to go to the hospital on a leg and die. My what? father had hand burns, you know, but the, the point was, you know, afterwards we're cleaning up the bedroom and putting out the sparks, you know, and wiping up the old pea soup remnants. My father says, what the hell did you bring in the pea soup container for? I said, Dad, it was full. It was already full. You know, had I stayed there and waited for it to be filled Yeah, up. forget about it. Oh, hey, you, you were been... thinking fast. You were thinking That's fast. Right. Get water on the fire quick. In, in, the book, in the book, I tell, I, I was proud of my first post-fire critique. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that is freaking good. awesome. Ten years what, old. what? What was? What were they? Were they smoking in bed? What was the story? Oh, he was a drinker and a smoker. Yeah, she yeah, was, yeah. He was it. working. Now he worked at the, a Melody Lounge up in uh, Queens Boulevard. Nice, it's a hot spot actually. And he said the next day, his buddy said, "Come on, let's go out drinking, Vin." You know, they, they would knock off at twelve. And he said, no, I'm going home because he had to get to work the next morning. So if he hadn't come home and went, instead went drinking with wow. his buddies, I might not have been here. So I said, wow. that was the first good luck I had in my life. I had a lot of good luck. And that was right. the first one. Yeah. And, yeah, and so you, didn't, you didn't run out of the building, Chief. You, uh, you stood right in there. <laughs> Boy, you know, there's some gonna... people in this, in this oh. uh, you know, little thing that might have ran for their life. Oh. You know, I'm just I saying. You, know. you got you to stay with your buddies. No, you got to be in charge. Yeah. yeah. Team, yeah. Teamwork. Yeah. So you grew up in Sunnyside, Queens, right? Yeah. Maybe maybe yeah. weren't the best of students uh, in school. I could have been though. I was the worst of students. My sister I was a say brain. That. My right. sister was a brain. She got ninety fives all the time. I I think my highest mark was a seventy. I was not a good student. You know, I I just uh, didn't want to study, and uh, I guess there were other things going on in my life. You know, of course, I tell a story. I got I got I got uh, left back in the seventh grade, and uh, then my mother took me out of St. Teresa's, which was the school right on my block there. But one of the reasons I wasn't a good student is uh, when I was in the seventh grade, my sister was five years older than me. Uh, maybe I was 11, 12, I don't know. So she had a boyfriend in Manhattan in 23rd Street. So. Um, my father worked in the daytime, worked a second job at night up at the Melody Lounge. And then he, he, my mother would meet him at a tavern and they would drink, you know, till the tavern closed every night. So my sister and I would pretend to be asleep. So about 10 o'clock, my mother would leave us and then we'd get up and get dressed. <laughs> and then she'd take me over to 23rd Street by the... Uh, there was a pool there. It's still there, 23rd Street, a big classical temple of 23rd Street pool. And uh, so she met her boyfriend, and I played around these columns at night, uh, jumping from column to column. And uh, we would take the 7 train back to Sunnyside, Lara, uh, Blue Street at the time, and get in bed before 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, before my parents came home. So needless to say... I failed everything in the second <laughs> quarter. <of> the year. <laughs> All right. Oh, goodness. They don't make them so, like that anymore. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Uh, so then they, you, you decide to join the Navy, correct? At 17 years right. old? So, so uh, we, we, before that, I mean, let's talk about my teenage waste, my, my teenage uh, wasteland. <laughs> you know, right. so, so now I'm a teenager, you know, and, uh, in, in Sunnyside, and it was a, you know, we had more bars on 48th Avenue and Queens Boulevard in that section than any sure. other neighborhood. Oh, so yeah. we at 15, like first time I got drunk, I was 15, my 15th birthday. Some guy, we got an older guy to buy five bottles of wine for us. And we chug lugged <laughs> me and three other guys chug lugged the five bottles of wine. Well, we were staggering all over the neighborhood. The, the cops picked up two of the guys and pumped their stomachs out in St. John's. Oh. Some somebody brought me home, thankfully, and I fell in in the house, and uh, so I was drinking all the time. You know, I, uh, I I had a job. I worked in Orbach's, but I would 
every weekend I spent my paycheck drinking up an Allen's bar and a Venice bar and, and uh, these bars on Queens Boulevard. So, so we really would drink and we would go, it's funny, I think about it. We, we started going out with girls at 15 and these were very proper, nice kids they were. And uh, we would go to dances at 15 and we, we would go out, meet them out there at Queen of Martyrs and Queens Boulevard. <laughs> The, they would have dances every Saturday night, and the nuns would watch you dance, you know. So uh, before <laughs> we'd go meet the girls, these four girls that we got hooked up with, you know, just as friends, we would get four bottles of wine, and we'd have suits and ties on, and we'd go into a dark alley and a lot, actually, and drink these four bottles of wine to get courage to go out the Queen of Martyrs and <laughs> dance with these girls. So I was going nowhere, and uh, so finally, you know, the Korean War started in the 50s. We all, some guys went back to high school. Then we all quit school. Some guys went back to high school. And three of us decide, hey, let's join the Navy. My, you know, Mike, Maddie, and myself. So we were 17, and we could get in on a, a minority cruise, you know, if you're 17. And you join at 17 and get out the day before you're 21. So we went down, we enlisted, we joined. And Mike got called first, and Mike went, and then six weeks later he came home on a medical discharge, migraine headaches. So I left the day he came home, and uh, he talked Maddie out of going. And he said if I was there, he would have talked me out of going to join the Navy, but I wasn't there. So you were the only one out of the three of them. I was the only one of the three went. And it saved my life. The Navy was the first structure. I had where I saw, you know, men I could relate to. Right, you know, right, right. No weren't drinking. And uh, so my life, my, my image of a man at 15 was to stand at a bar and drink a beer in the sunny side. That's what I thought a man was. <laughs> so when I went into the Navy, I mean, you know, it was like the fire service. You saw good men who were role models for you. The camaraderie and, of, the, of everything. Mm -hmm. right? Camaraderie oh, and no nonsense, you know. You, no nonsense. Uh, you had yeah, to yeah, really, yeah. Uh, they were the bosses. But a slip of a limbo, anyway. sink a ship. Yes, right, right, right. So, <laughs> anyway, so I, I joined at 17 to get out of the Navy. And my, my sister eloped to get, as soon as she could at 18. She got married to the guy from 23rd Street. And uh, so I started my life's journey in the, in the Navy. And uh, I didn't really do much better in there. I, I uh, partied for three and a half years. You know, I, uh, like I said, I, in the Navy, I learned how to swab a floor with a mop. I learned how to drive a two and a half ton truck. I learned how to fire a 45 caliber pistol. I, nice. I, I learned about sex in a red light district. Hold on, Chief. I never heard of these red lights di districts. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 you you yeah. describe the red lights district? <laughs> allegedly, oh, allegedly. I, allegedly. Let me tell you what. It was, it was, it's amazing. I'm For years teasing. afterwards, I would dream of colored lights. You went, you, you took a boat over to Camonero, and it was a town of wooden shacks, one street. Uh, uh, shacks on both sides, and they were bars. There was Chicago bar, New York bar, Ohio bar, Connecticut bar. Every there were towns where they thought the sailors came from, and they were it was lined with women. I mean, so uh, you work your way from one you know bar to, <laughs> to one state to the, the next <laughs> until you found a lady you, you liked, and it. it was uh, an amazing. Allegedly. But I dreamt of colored lights for years <laughs> afterwards. Because they all had colored lights, you know. So, uh, but I survived. I didn't catch any diseases. So some guys did. But uh, and I. But the good thing was, I learned. Uh, I I got a GED diploma in the Navy. My father kept bugging me, Vin, go in there, get it, take the tests, get the four tests, get that high school diploma. I did near the end of my tour. And I got it. I, I actually got got the certificate of my marks, which are not great, but passing. And uh, I'm going to have that frame with my college degrees. And actually, the GED goes on top. That's that was it. The most that started the whole thing. Yeah. That was the most important degree. So anyway, so, uh, so anyway, I got 
I got discharged the day before, it's 21, uh, May 11th, 1956. Ten days later, I'm in the, taking the test. You know, I remember what the devil hand is for one class, fire tech for one class. And the guy said to me next to me, he says, how long are you going here? I said, it's my first class. Oh, he says, you don't have a chance. Yeah, you're, you know, I've been going here for six months. So, <laughs> I've been coming here for six months. <laughs> so, but what he didn't know was my father had signed the application for the registration, and he sent me the, an ARCO book book about prior tests ah, so when i was nice. on the boats and and i was on god duty you know trying to keep castro from coming already down, studying yeah study i was doing this uh nice. doing these question and answers and i would get a 40 or 50 on the test erase all the answers take the test again wow. and, and then i got that so so that was the key they there were a lot of word questions and i uh i looked at i got the 78 i got 78 on the test and i was in great shape i was working down the markets loading trucks so i got 91 on the physical they combined everything and my, my veterans preference i was in the top 200 so i, I think i was uh, wow that's great yeah that's where great. is the great. yeah where is the part where, where when you said you stole the webster's dictionary from the okay naval let, me, <laughs> let, let me tell you that thank you kevin for asking me that this has been a big deal which is not finished in the book so um, I'm down and running the boats, Guantanamo to Caminero, and uh, uh, doing my tests. And there's an old ragged dictionary there, Naval Station Boatshed, that I'm using, looking up the words. You know, they ask me a synonym. What, what's a rat? Is it a rodent, fish, animal? So I'm looking up words. And, you know, so when I get discharged, now, you know, I put this dictionary in my sea bag. So I come home, I pass the test, and, and and 10 years later, I'm at my mother's house, and I happen to see this scraggly uh, dictionary on the table in Naval Station boat shed. And now I said to myself, Jesus, I stole this thing from the Naval Station. So now when I'm writing this book, and I've been thinking about this all the time, so I, I said, well, you know, I'm going to buy a computer, a thousand dollar computer, and send it down because nobody does dictionaries anymore. So, I, uh, I, go online, which I rarely do, and I'm asking this. I'm on a live chat with a sailor, and I tell him I want to give him a thousand. I owe. I want to send a thousand bucks to the naval base. He says, no, no, you, you can't do that. They will not accept money. He's maybe a dictionary they might accept. So. I said, okay, give me the give me, have a phone number. I was in a naval station boat shed, and uh, he said, well, I got a phone number of the library. Now, I used to go into the library, cool, quiet library, funny place, and, and I would study for my GED test. So I call, I call up the number, never expecting to get an answer, and I don't. And then the other one afternoon, I just, let me call again. I call Guy answers phone, Naval Station boat shed. A woman answers. I says, hello, is this the Naval Station boat shed? Yes, we're in, we're in Guantanamo. I says, hey, I tell her the story. My name is Vincent Dunn. I was in the Naval Station. I started out in your library. And I, I said, I inadvertently took a lot of <laughs> Inadvertently. From, from Allegedly. The Naval Station boat shed. And I want to send one back to you. Uh, you know, so you can give it to the naval station boat shed. So she says, she gives me the Tiffany Fiddler is the librarian. Now I'm talking to Tiffany Fiddler. So she is delighted. She says to me, you know, you have, you have re 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 renewed my faith in human nature. After 65 years. I, I said, I really do. My conscience is killing me. So, you know, I, I read every I read every <laughs> word in the dictionary already. I, I can't use it. Well, I, actually, I did get. I got to like that dictionary. If you, if you, you know, if you read a dictionary, uh, there's not only words in the back of a dictionary. It has That's great, this great definitions of what is a hurricane, tornado. It yeah, describes yeah, yeah. everything back there. Incredible. I was stunned when I would read this dictionary, the back of it, not just the words. So anyway, so now I'm all set. I go to 
Barnes and Nobles, I buy two giant dictionaries, one for the library and one for the Naval Station Bullshit. And I write Tiffany Fiddler, the librarian, a letter. And I said, dear Tiffany, <clears throat> I, I, I thank you for your beautiful, cool, quiet library. I want to send two dictionaries. And I sent a, report, a letter to the, to the Naval Station, to the boat shed where I worked. I said, dear chief, my name is Vincent Dunn Seaman. I put my serial number down. And I accidentally took a dictionary from your <laughs> boat shed. I'd like to return it. I apologize. <laughs> And, and, I, and I put two from Vincent Dunn. I sent to Tiffany Fiddler, and I sent her a nice letter. I said, dear Tiffany, your library was where I first started studying on my for my life's journey, and I can't tell you how much I love your library. And I sent her a nice personal letter. So now she's going to, she said to me, Mr. Dunn, will you please send me that, that, uh, um, and I told her about my m memoir. Would you please send me a copy? Would love to have it in the library. So I autographed the copy of my book. I sent that down with the two dictionaries. So now, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm waiting for her to say they they arrived. She she told me the dictionaries are there. She sent the one over to the naval station, the boat shed where I work. And now uh, I want her to tell me she got my memoir book and she would put it in the library so i'm going to go down i'm sure they're going to put a little frame i'm going to go down in the history nice. of the Guantanamo. Nice. that's a great story my editor my editor went crazy when you know because it didn't finish in the memoir what i really did but i i sent two big giant dictionaries for a couple of hundred bucks down there i didn't get the but and i sent my memoir book so my conscience is clear I'm very pleased Good for you that. And hey, listen, nice. I, I got a signed copy too, and you didn't even have to steal anything from me. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see that, Kobe. Oh, you see can't it. see it. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. If, if anything, this show tonight will renew the faith of every librarian across the globe. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, let me let me tell you something. I mean, I spent many, even when I was studying for lieutenant, you know, uh, and going to school, I hung out in libraries. I was a a library evaluator. I went to the library in uh, in Sunnyside. I went to the library in uh, Woodside. I went to the library in Forest Hills. I went. The best library was in one in Elmhurst, you know. And I and the only library I used to go to a library in Forest Hills. That's a, the only library where the people would shush the librarians for making noise, you know. Uh, and that was such a studious library in Forest Hills. They they didn't want the librarians making noise. So uh, and of course we're in college. So I, I, I know I, I, a lot about libraries. I that's spent so many, crazy, many, Chief. That you, uh, yeah. you started out as such a I don't want to say a poor student and look a at what you're I mean. I, I, mean sons, I fell in love with I fell in love with <clears> you know with every <throat> with I don't know what it's called, words and education. But I was a late starter. And again, I was uh, so, 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 you want me to tell you about ice, the Iceman Sun? You want me to stop? Oh, no, no, yeah. First of all, let, okay. let's talk about before you, before, because okay. that came when you had one year on the job, right? So, yes. um, uh, let's go. You, you get assigned to a 59 engine, correct? Correct. Yes. Right? 59 engine. But back in the day, uh, how you would find out your assignment is that you would go to the nearest firehouse okay. to where you lived, right? And then, uh, yes, yes. So you go to uh, 325, right? And the captain there. Oh, shit. Bill, the captain. So I walk in there. I, I, may, I may have looked like, a, you know, I don't know what I looked like when I was young. I was not Mr. Preppy. But I walked into the firehouse. I, and I go upstairs. The officer's there. Bill, uh, Lieutenant, uh, Captain Russell, he was a World War II veteran. Wow, look at him. He was man. busy, you know. And I walk in. I said, you know, I'm reporting. I'm supposed to find out where I'm assigned. He, he looks up the orders. You know, you're assigned to, you know, 59 engine, 137th Street, between 7th and, and Lenox Avenue. You know, you got to report there tomorrow morning. So I said, you know, what is it like? Can you tell me anything? He said, you'll find out when you get there. So <laughs> I I, so I go, go there. And then, of course, in 1962, I'm at a dance. And uh, I, hear, I hear six firefighters died at the Maspit Fat Factory 
and one of them was uh, Lieutenant uh, Captain Wall, uh, Captain. Uh, uh, All right, three twenty-five. Yeah, three twenty. The captain, three twenty-five. Wow. Uh, Bill Russell, Will, William Russell, and uh, the, the the big lesson there was at that fire. You know, it was a vacant factory. We didn't have collapse zones or anything, and uh, they were overhauling. The chief of department has the fire. The fire is knocked down. You know. And it's out. It's under control. The chief leaves and he says to the assistant chief, don't let anybody back into the building. So he leaves. Now, these guys are operating underneath the shed outside right. the building, directing a stream in there at the remaining rubble, smoldering fire. And the the uh, parapet of this two-story factory collapses for some reason on top of the shed and the shed crushes these firefighters, there's 20 firefighters on the, on this loading platform. <clears throat> that is, that they, 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 they dig out 14 and six were, were dead when they got to them. But it was, so it was a tragedy. But when I'm writing about that fire, I said, what was the lesson? What could we say was the lesson? What the lesson learned, we learned that that tragedy was that hey, if you're told to get out of a building, uh, if you're operating underneath the canopy, a shed, a, a marquee, you're actually technically still in that building. So the wall could knock the shed down and then kill them as it did. So underneath the shed or a canopy or a marquee has to be considered as inside the burning building when you're an incident commander. So if they say, oh, we're outside, chief. You know, under no, no, you're under the shed. Get out from the shed. So, so that was a tragedy. And so William uh, Russell, the captain that, that uh, told me where to go, was killed at, the, at a club. So we, going back, going back even before that, when I, uh, I, you know, I took the test in 56. Uh, so I think I took it in. I came out in, what did I do? No, I took the, I came out in May. I took the test May 21st, but April of 56. The six guys in the Bronx uh, Third Avenue fire were killed when the marquee collapsed and pulled the parapet wall down on top of the uh, uh, six firefighters from 48 engine, and, and and they died. So that was on uh, you know I, I'm, my mother, you know when I come on the fire service, you know and I get accepted, I'm coming on, you know that was on the news. Yeah, and, right, right, and right. I was very conscious of hey, these guys got killed in this war collapse. <laughs> So she she said to my father, who gave me the, who registered me and put the application in, and encouraged me to take the job. My mother would say to my father, "If anything ever happens to that kid, I'm going to kill you." She'd say. I'm kill you. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, but because uh, she was concerned about that, but so was I, and so that may have been, you know, between Captain Russell and uh, the All right back the, to back, do it two of yeah. those jobs. That's so great. Right away. Uh, you know, parable war collapses were on my mind. And of course, that was the subject of my first article in 1978 in WNYF 4th issue of 78. Parables were on my mind. But anyway, so uh, so that was it. So my first day in the firehouse. So I, Russell tells me on the 37th, I, I, I live in Sunnyside. I get on the train at uh, the 7th train at Lowry, take it to... Uh, I guess the Grand Central, and then I take the uptown train to 135th Street and Lenox Avenue. That's where the stop was. I get up, I walk upstairs, sunny day. I walk up to 100, two blocks to 137th Street on Lenox, and then I walk up to 7th Avenue looking for a firehouse. And uh, I don't see any firehouse. I walk up to the block. I'm at the corner of 7th Avenue, uh, uh, and I look down, and I see this thing that looks like a garage with a green door. You know, there's no there's no flag out. It's before <laughs> nine o'clock. I said that must be the fires. So uh, nothing there. 180, 137th Street. No, no. I of course it was. I guess all of the written in stone, but and, and there was a plaque, but I didn't see it. So now I'm at the corner. I can see it. It's maybe three, one building down from seven thirty. So now it's eight o'clock, and I'm not going to the fires an hour early. So I walk down the street. To uh, 7th Avenue to 130, 125th Street. You know, I got to go to the bathroom. So I stop into a bar. The bar's open in Harlem at 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the morning. So 
I order a beer. I go to the men's room at the urinal. The guy comes in. He says to me, you want a woman? I said, no. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Who does the red light district again? <laughs> no, no. Who just, well, you put a white guy up in Harlem. It is. That's what you're looking for. How, how, how do you how do you land in in like you know like in luck like this at all times? <laughs> yeah. First the red like district, now this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Well, I knew, but I didn't. I was not looking for sex that morning. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I was scared. I was scared. I was scared. White House. So uh, anyway, so I walked back up to uh, uh, 100, 137th Street. I. Uh, Knock on the door. Guy is at the house. Why opens up the door? I said, I'm a new firefighter. I'm in khakis, by the way. Nobody told me to put dungarees on. I'm in khakis. So I said, I'm the new fire. I'm the new probe. So the guy says, go in the back. So I walk in. I walk past the squad van. No, it was an, I think it was an open truck then. And then I walk to a 36 Mac, an old pumper, oh 36 God. Mac. And this is 1957. And I go into the kitchen in the back. First thing I see is a black firefighter and a white firefighter sitting at the table playing cards with a quarter beer on the table. Oh, so I, you know, I just glance at that. I go, they're watching television. I sit down, uh, and nobody says anything. I'm watching. So finally, the officer comes out. We got a new problem. It was a new problem. So I say, you're right here. He says, what the hell are you in? Didn't they tell you to get some uniform? I say, see, like there were so many of us. That uh, there was like they made 300, I think, the first batch, and they only had room for 150 at the training schools. So they sent the other 150 right to the firehouses. So uh, we had no training. So you I really knew that. nothing when you walked in there. <laughs> Absolutely no, no, nothing. <laughs> nothing. So at 9 20, they go, hey, get out. We got a job. So <laughs> you, know, this fire truck, you know, I'm holding on. I said, what the hell? And the guy said, put a helmet on. Help with rubber coat and boots. So I, I, I said, well, what the hell the am I doing here? So, uh, so they get to oh a, my God. Uh, the building. It was an oil burner fire. We were second to, you know, and the, I see the squad guy comes out all blackened from the soot. And he says, an oil burner fire chief. And uh, so we went back to quarters. So uh, so that was my. Uh, he got a helmet my, and khakis on. Uh, yeah, I had khakis on. I had, to I had a rubber coat, a rubber coat and a helmet, somebody's helmet and boots. I guess I had boots too. Did so, the khaki uh, survive, sir? No, the next day I had to wear some grease. I know that. You know, so I, I came in, I bought a, uh, you know, blue shirt and I went to, I went to uh, Army Navy store. I bought dungarees and I bought a blue shirt. So uh, uh, I was all set the next day. And, you know, like I said, <clears throat> it was a strange firehouse. There was a little friction between the engine and the squad. Now you got to picture this. The engine was, you know, uh, uh, the squad had been formed in 1955, two years before I came on the job. So uh, this firehouse was a single house in Harlem. These guys were tight, you know. When that squad came in that firehouse, it was, you know, oil and water. Now they, you know, they said a lot of guys who were assigned to this squad were pulled together from all over the city. You know, and there's a sign in the squad one. And some, you know, guys were young. Some guys were, were great veterans. I mean, I worked with some great guys in squad one. But a lot of guys were, you know, the two guys were drinking beer, playing cut, were in the squad. You know, so there was young, you know, not so good guys and, and really good veterans in the squad. But so the engine didn't like the squad. One of the reasons was they didn't carry hose. And when they, if they stretched our hose, they would leave it there. They'd get another run. Got <laughs> so, so, another job coming in. We'll see you later. They got another heard of that. They got another job. Sometimes no they idea what you're talking about. What's yeah. the uh, What's the famous line? I'd rather have a sister in the whorehouse than a brother in the squad. <laughs> <laughs> I, never said that. I don't know where you got that from. <laughs> no, got that. Actually, you know, well, a lot of guys were transferring into the squad. I never did. I, you know, but one of the guys who did transfer into the squad was. Bill Grimes, you know, Captain Willie from 31 Truck. And he, he, all I remember is he was like a military man. And he, he you know, I had to make a hose trap and he could do the weaving and the, 
he got he made me a help made me a host rap. He always laughed about that because I always told him about that. But then, uh, but there was friction between the two. They had masks. We had no masks. You know, so they would grab. They were line stealers. You know, and they they wouldn't pick up the hose. They were line stealers. So there was, you know, we got along, but it was not. You know, they they were not. They didn't play nice in the sandbox. <laughs> yeah, like like one time, a friend of mine from Sunnyside. Actually, he came down. He wanted the uh, he wanted the action. He came down from the Bronx, and he's you know he got assigned to the squad, and uh, and then six months later he transfers out. I said, say, hey, well, gee, what what the hell happened? He says, I'm getting out of here. He says, there's no bosses down there. There's nobody in charge down there. So he left. He didn't like the uh, the you know there was some you know, some groups had good bosses, but many times they you know they they weren't. A tight unit, so you had to survive. So, like I said in the book, you know, I used to hang out at the at the uh, out at the uh, house watch desk, you know, because I'd sit on the radiator or the windowsill, you know, with the radiator talking to the house watch guy. You could ask him questions; he would answer you without being contradicted by somebody in the kitchen. In the kitchen. There was no discussion of firefighting. There was drinking and laughing and fighting and TV watching, but there was not too much going on in the kitchen. So I would hang out in the in the front by the housewife, desk, and then you could size up the firefighters who were there. Some guys knew what they were talking about. Some guys didn't know. So my learning initially happened at the housewife's desk, you know, and and then the only drilling I remember we did in this firehouse was this lieutenant used to love to fill up a bucket, a tin bucket of half filled with water and make us swing the bucket around to demonstrate centrifugal force. You know, the water wouldn't fall out of the bucket if we swung it fast enough. And that was the, how our pumpers, you know, developed the pressure for the hose streams. So that was one of the, the one things I do remember, centrifugal force. So that was it. I said, well, you know, and then one officer would say, stay with me, kid. Another one would say, stay with the, 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 uh, the, uh, senior, the senior man. So, so, all right. So now I'm in there trying to figure out what to do. And uh, St. Patrick's night, my first fire. So we, so on 7th Avenue, on 39th Street, six-story tenement. So we stretch a, um, get the first line, inch and, three, inch and a half, actually, up into the fourth floor of this tenement. And we got the hose line, salt water, we got the line, we got the excess hose. And uh, all of a sudden they, they force open his door and this black stuff come pouring out. You know, so I'm saying, what the hell are these guys gonna do here now? I mean, this is good, I'm gonna watch this. I, you know, they're not going in there. Well, they start to jump all over each other to get the nozzle. And then the one guy from the squad with the mask, with the scot, Grabbed the nozzle. Bob Powers was his name, and he uh, he takes it in. And now I hear boom, boom, the pounding of this hose stream on the hollow plaster walls. And then he must have got to the kitchen, knocked the good dishes up. Now I try to go into this, you know, to this apartment, and so I can't, I can't make it. You get hit with the heat. So I come back. How the hell did he get in there? Well, then I see everybody's crouched down. So now I crouch down and I've got to get with, you know, guy, kid, you got to stay with that hose line. So I crouch in, you know, and I stayed with that hose line. And uh, that was the first fight. And so I said, I thought the guys would not go in there. I saw, like I said, I saw men do what they said they were going to do for the first time in my life, actually. And in a bad situation like that. And I, I said, you know what? I, I want to be like those guys. I want to be a firefighter. And that was, I never looked back from that moment. That was uh, my initiation. And uh, something happened that night where I said, I want to be a firefighter. And I just saw these guys. They were, they were tough, you know, tough guys. You know, they were not, you know, scholars. I don't know where the officer was, but I remember Bob Powers. I got to know him well. And he was, uh, and the other guys were tough Men, they were tough working men, that uh, that lived in these firehouses. So, so that was uh, 
my first fire. You know what, Chief? I said I've said this before that <clears throat> when you when you first get on a job, even for yourself, like you just said, you watched what these guys did, right? So oh. it's it's the same exact thing. Like you don't know how far what you can do until somebody show, especially in something like that. And that's where that showing of the young guys, like how far you can go into certain things, and you trust this the yeah. boss and you trust the senior yeah. man, and and that's how you learn the job over over years and years. Well, well, they say there's a saying that you don't go any you don't go anywhere you haven't been taken, you know, you know. The veterans take you into these fires, and once you are taken into these fires by the veteran, you know you can go into it. That's how we pass on the job. So, uh, no, you know, and you you see these guys that that are that are become role models, and you want to be like, and then who are really salt of the earth. That's yeah, all you. Yeah. Can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, if I was to ask you your number one influence, who would you say? Okay. Okay. So, my number now one. Now it's time. The Iceman okay. son. And the Iceman son. So I, uh, <coughs> I'm in. You know. So now I guess I'm in. A, I'm in, in February, March or April. Another guy is assigned to 59 inches. Name is Frank Lemuskio. So. Uh, I say, hey, geez, I'll be able to boss somebody around now. You know, I'm, I won't be the Johnny anymore. So uh, this guy comes walking into the firehouse. I must have been there that day. He's got a college sweater on, smoking a pipe. The collar has a letter on, which I don't understand. You know, whatever that is for. And he's a he's a weightlifter, so he's got muscles up the kazoo. And he walks in. He's I'm Frank, a little skill, you know. So uh, okay, so. He goes through what I went through, and then uh, we start to talk, and we bonded, you know, because we nobody paid any attention to us. They didn't like probies, so uh, uh, they're in the kitchen. You know, we, we could go out and buy the beer, but we we couldn't drink the beer when you're on probation, you know. And even you know, uh, there's there's a no drinking policy now, but that was not like that back then. So uh, we would buy beer for them at 11. After they did the committee work and did everything, they would have us run around, get some beer, and they would stop partying at 11, 12 o'clock in the afternoon with the lunch. <clears throat> Sometimes there wasn't lunch. But anyway, Frank and I were out at the housewife's desk, you know. So for Frank, you know, we're actually at, when we have to raise the hose, we go up to the hose tower. And Frank says, you know, Vin, we, we were bonding. So he said, we should take <clears throat> over the top of this hose tower here. You know, it's a nice little area you know you it was on a we had the, the third the apparatus floor the bunk room and the top floor and then you went up to a to a ladder you know a wooden stairway to the bulkhead it was a big and large bulkhead where we pulled the hose and hooked them on to drop yeah. mm -hmm. well, well frank said this is a nice little point. we can make an office out of this <laughs> so, so so i said okay he said, let's get a desk and some weights he wanted the weights he was you know, he was a lifter so a physical fitness. So we carry a desk up there, a couple of chairs. Uh, speed bag. We, speed bag. Well, that was my get. And then I, I don't know who did that. Frank put, oh, we was with us. So we had a speed bag on the top floor. So uh, Frank would be lifting his weights. And I love the speed bag because I used to have to do that in the Navy. So I could ah. use the speed bag for an hour. You know, you know I'm thinking I'm building up my arms. So I would have a hand grips, and I'm building up my arm for pulling ceilings and for the hose. So I could punch that bag for an hour. And, of course, you know, we had some tough guys down in the kitchen. So we didn't want them coming up to punching us. So we were lifting weights, and, and they could hear the punching bag for an hour. So that sort of dissuaded them from coming up, picking on us. <laughs> I would always make sure I got that in in the morning. <laughs> so Frank and I were pretty physically fit. You know, he, he was, uh, so then, you know, he says to me, and now Frank was already going to college. And, you know, I'm a high school dropout. I just got a GED diploma. So Frank says, I'm going over, I'm going to college. You know, I'm going to go over to 139th Street. There's a school over there. And I'm going to tell them I'm going to go to school for teaching. And I'm halfway through. Maybe I can get a job over there. So Frank goes over and gets a job teaching, you know, in between tours at a school on 139th Street. That's so uh, he, he's, he's, he's already calculated. And then he says to me, Finn, are you a veteran? I said, yeah, I'm a veteran. He says, come on, 
Let's go out to Queens College. We'll register. They've got a fire administration course out there. They'll pay us to go to school. The government pays you in a GI Bill. So uh, awesome. I, I, I somehow go out there and register for municipal management courses, you know, which are, it was a very rare, it was the beginning of the fire science courses. Nobody had this, <clears throat> John Jay didn't have anything. It was, uh, Queens College had a two year associate's degree and it was taught by guys like Lou Harris. He was a captain, the chief of fire prevention, you know, big chiefs, lawyers. Uh, there were, you know, Charlie Walsh was the third division commander. You know, he was a deputy, uh, <clears throat> Chili Charlie, they'd call him. So, so we start to go out to these, to these, taking these college courses taught by rising <clears throat> stars or top commanders in the fire service. So, uh, so Frank and I, we, we go out there and we start to take the courses. And, and then Frank says to me, hey, Vin, let's start studying for lieutenant. You know, the te I think once there was a test in for lieutenant in 59, and there was a possibility that you would only need two years to take this test. Because prior, there was a chief's son who only had two years and took the 55 test and passed it. So we were saying, you know, we might be able to have, have to take this test. Now it turned out you needed three years to be first right. grade. Mm -hmm. to take yeah. So anyway, but we started studying anyway. Now the guys in the firehouse are furious. What the, you guys aren't even firemen and you're studying for the <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we got a couple of veterans like Bob Powers joined our class, you know, and uh, Casey Mitchelson. So we had a... <clears throat> A good class, you know. After we did our committee work, we started studying, and and uh, you latched onto the right guy, Chief, huh? What? What? You latched onto the right guy. Well, I, uh, Lewis Gill was, uh, you know, and a lot of guys didn't like him. He was so ambitious. But wait a minute. Now that was only part of the story. Frank went on. He got interested in the union. I think he rose up to be a vice president of of the officers' union. Eventually, he. Uh, 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 his wife uh, became a travel agent, and they had a big travel agency. They flew half of the top command of the fire service all over the world. I mean, he invested wow. in real estate in Astoria, you know, and he became a millionaire. He's got a house at, on a water in my neighborhood for five or six million dollars. So uh, it's a beautiful. He's not house. Too, too, too bad. He's not too shabby. He's not too shabby, but but. Like I said, some guys were turned off by his ambition. It was just what I needed. I was ambitionless, less until I met him. <laughs> and he sparked, me. he sparked me. And then one day, you know, like he says to me, you know, Vin, I said, where the heck did you get all this ambition from? He says, my father was a nice man. I want to be somebody. And he certainly did achieve that. So uh, I always thank Frank Lamuschio. And uh, Chief, well, just, just really quick because – for, yeah. We do have a younger audience who may not understand what an <coughs> ice man is. Can you explain what an ice man is? I could do. You know, before we had electrical refrigerators, we had these wooden boxes, you know, which were insulated wooden boxes. You can still buy them as antiques. But this guy would have a truck, open truck, full of uh, uh, kegs, They're slabs, yeah, yeah, slabs, slabs of kegs, yeah. kegs. Slabs of ice that weighed 100, 200 pounds. And he had these big clippers that they would clip and they would throw the ice right. over their shoulders. Right. Walk right. up three stories, you know, and then chop it up, you know, and put it in the, chop chunks of it and put it in the, the, the ice box. With the ice pick. That's where the, the ice pick came the ice from. Pick. That's you right. Know, I mean, they, they were tough. They were the toughest of the tough, you know, so. Uh, so Frank said, I ain't doing that. <laughs> That's not for me. <laughs> Let's go to college, Ben. Yeah. And yeah. So he, got, he got me started, and uh, and he, he finished his degree, and I finished my associate degree. He got a bachelor's degree. And then we studied, and we both passed the lieutenants, and I think Bob Powers did too. And uh, we went on to become chiefs in a job. But uh, – Wow. Chief, I, Chief Turner, I got a question for you. You know, do you yeah. think that uh, there was this divide 
between, let's say, they didn't like his ambition. I, I know you said that a few times, right? They didn't like that. Do you think there was a divide between the working fireman and the guy who wanted to be an officer back then because of the culture of the uh, fire fire service? Well, yeah, yeah, there definitely was. Now, now, there definitely was. They did not. Once you declared you wanted to study, you know, you were saying, in effect, to the guys, I want to be your boss. So not everybody. Some guys were big enough not to get upset. But a lot of guys, especially if you were junior. They yeah, resented. if you were young, right. Yeah, right. you were young, like we were young kids. So there was resentment to that. But, but I always, I mean, I never, even as an officer, I knew, you know, my upbringing in the, in the firehouse, I never, I could always negotiate that. I mean, I, uh, you know, one of the things I always remember when I made lieutenant, I get assigned to uh, to uh, 33 engine, and my chauffeur in 33 engine, Adi Dima, is a 65 year old man. You know, you know. So okay. now I, I have drills down there. I was down there. You know, the the rock was big. They would call us over and embarrass us if we didn't do well. So I started doing lessons, training about masks and and Adi Dima is in the class, but. Uh, so I felt, you know, and people said to me, do you feel strange being a young f officer? I always looked young too, and I was young. And I said, the guy, Adi Dima, especially, he acknowledged what I did. He, he stayed with the group. He listened to what I said. But of course, let me tell you about Adi Dima. He was a handball expert. And Adi Dima would take two young firemen up to a four wall handboard court up in the attic and beat their ass off. This guy was no, this guy was no. But but I acknowledge, you know, Adi Dima was the informal boss in my group. You know, I was never going to tell Adi Dima anything. You know, we, you know, you know, I was a kid in his fire truck when we responded to fire. I got so yeah, I understood yeah, yeah. that. And, you know, but, you know, I do think that, uh, many veteran firefighters like to see a young guy that knows what he's doing, you know, and, and they support, I was always supported. I never had anybody, you know, I mean, except in the beginning when Frank and I started studying, that was a, a little, we weren't even first grade firemen for crying out loud. Yeah, so yeah, we yeah, deserve yeah. to be criticized, but, uh, but they, they let you alone. I mean, and of course, when we were firefighters, I mean, the, biggest incentive to, to become an officer is when you see a firefighter in your company get promoted. Like in my case, it was Bill Grimes. You know, he was a, you know, a squad in the engine, went to the squad, and then he got promoted. When I saw him at a fire as a lieutenant, I said, oh, Jesus, I, I, I knew him. I, I, I talked to him. He made my whole strap. I guess I could be a fireman, a lieutenant too. I mean that's that's what motivates. Yeah. So so that was it. I mean Frank was an outspoken guy. I was not an outspoken guy in the firehouse. I wanted to study. You know I did my job. I was a good firefighter. I never I didn't want to transfer to the squad. I remained loyal to the engine. You know I learned. I cut my teeth yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the engine company. I had fires. I put up my first fire without without a mask. I was an acting lieutenant one day in a cell of fire. You know, and I put the phone, we put the fire out. I was behind a knot of it. I said, Jesus, I can, you know, after I put out a fire and after I became an acting lieutenant, I said, I can do this job. So, the, mm. you know, and, and then, uh, and then I knew I could do it because, you know, that's how you, you know, uh, you get you to in the waters. You touch the waters. Water. Yeah. And of course, you know, you have to rationalize. You see these superstars. So how I rationalize, I mean, even my father-in-law, my father-in-law was a, veteran 20 year veteran in 53 engine in, in Spanish Harlem. So I used to say to my father-in-law, almost apologizing that I was studying because I was married to his daughter. I says, uh, you know, Walter, I said, you know, there are these, there is these great chiefs and officers. And then it was just, just nuts, the, these uh, jerks. I mean, I had an officers that were jerks and he, he had a lot of officers that were jerks, you know, so I said, but there's a lot of room in between the real superstars and the jerks in the fire. Right. 
the guys came into the firehouse, didn't know anything, you right. know. Uh, right, so right, right. when you saw that, you say, Jesus, I could do that job better than that. So, so I rationalized it. I was never going to be a superstar, but I know I could be better than the jerk. And it was something, <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of room in between. There's a lot of room. <laughs> a lot of and, room. I'm, and I'm shooting for the higher and one. I'm, that's it. I'm yeah. shooting for the higher yeah. guy. So anyway. So that's, well, that's that must you, have been tough though, like you said, like your father in law was, uh, oh, Jesus. Tough, you know, re just a regular fireman, you know, not well, that there's no, anything wrong with that, no, obviously. Let but. me tell you, let me tell you something. My father, <laughs> my father in law, who I, I grew to love, you know, was was Archie Bunker. He, <laughs> my father in law was Archie Bunker, and I he would have us over his house every Sunday, and his, and his wife would cook a dinner. For us, every Sunday, myself and and Joe, the the other firefighter, right, and my wife, and and we would have dinner, and then he would break out the beer and the cheese and the nuts, and we would start the drink after oh. dinner for two hours, every single Sunday, you know the girls would go out into the kitchen and talk, but I grew to love my father-in-law, you know Archie Bunker, you know after you know it. As long as he lived, he was a stunning, you know, he was a, a tough guy. All he, he wanted to be a plumber. He loved plumbing, but it's, he could have beat me up all my life. The guy was so tough, <laughs> you know, and uh, he was a, a nozzle man in the 53 engine. He yeah, worked yeah. with uh, a famous Captain Martin Sheen there, uh, became a chief. He was a pretty well-respected guy. And uh, Martin Sheen used to say to Walter, if I could only harness you, if I could only harness you, because <laughs> he was a wild man. My father-in-law was a, a wild, wild man. man, you know. So he was. He loved to fight, you know. He, chief, he, it doesn't hurt to he, have a leg up on the uh, father-in-law. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, no yeah, no doubt about it. Oh yeah, He's well, we in got up. I never, I never had a leg up on that man. <laughs> he was the boss, you know. He was the boss from. For my entire life, you know, he was. Yes, somebody you like to I talk mean, about the job? That's all we did. We yeah. all talked well, about. He's right. He said he's, he's, he's drinking. We talked about the fire department. <laughs> 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 Fighting down the cellar. Talk about Jimmy Ward <laughs> coming into the fire. Like his his idol was Jimmy Ward. He was a big chief. He says he'd come into the firehouse. He we he would be drinking beer, playing cards, and studying the book of regulation at the same time. That was his ideal of it. I couldn't do that. But he said, Jimmy Ward would drink at the beer, play cards with the guys, and read the book of regulation. And he was mm -hmm. a big, he was the chief of training at the time. But uh, no, those guys were were really supermen. So, and uh, I, I admired them too. Chief, uh, in one part in your book, you say your father used to ask you, what does a firefighter do? And, and, and okay. you didn't know so, until a certain job, right? Well, you know, I mean, like uh, the... Uh, you know, my father, you know, you're growing up, you're looking at your father. My father worked in a comptroller's office in city, in city Hall, and down in the municipal building, signed papers all his life. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he couldn't get promoted. And he, he, he had a good life. He, 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 I would visit him down in the municipal building. And he was a, cler a clerical person. And... Uh, but I could never identify what he did. You know, I wanted to know. And then I joined the Navy and I wasted my time in the Navy. Got no trade. You know, I got my GED, thank God. And uh, I come out and I, and I'm saying, so I come, out of, I come out of the Navy. I'm sitting in the kitchen talking to my father. And I said, dad, you know, I don't know what I want to be. So he, my father was always saying, Ben, what do you want to be? What do you want to be? So my grandfather was a stonemason, so I'd always say construction. I knew he, he could, I had an uncle that made, who was a construction steam fitter, and he made more money than my father. He actually bought a house. My father rented a house. So I would always say construction, construction. So one day when I came out of the Navy, again, I had no skill. I'm 21. I said to my father, well, you know, Dad, I think I'd like to be a butcher. I think I'd like to be a bother. I'd like to be a, a, a plumber. You know, I want to be able to do something. He got pissed off at me. He said, what do you mean? It? You know, he was a white collar guy. He didn't like me saying I wanted to be a butcher or, or a barber or, or, you know, but I wanted to learn 
to do something. Or to trade or something. You know, what, something, do, right? what, yeah. what do you do? You're a man. What the, so now I get married and I move into an apartment house, nice apartment house in Elmhurst, you know, and I don't know electrician, electrical work. I don't know plumbing work. So I got to call down to the office and, and these guys come up and fix my my uh, my fiction that's not working, my plummet. I'm saying, Jesus, I went to a vocational school. I would have liked to have, have learned those trees, you know. And my father-in-law, you know, Archie Bunker, 53 inches, could do anything. Christ, he, he rebuilt his house. So here I am. I can't, you know, can't hammer a nail. So uh, hmm. any one day I'm in, I'm in laying down. My wife is out, and I'm uh, laying in bed. And I guess it was napping. So I hear screaming, help, help. And Jesus Christ, I jump out of bed. I go out, I throw on this, I, um, I throw on this uh, polyester robe. Don't ask me how I, I never wear a robe. Today. I run, run out in the hallway. Uh, there's my neighbor across the hallway. The door's open. Heavy smoke is coming out the door. Top of the, the plumber and the electrician and the, the person in charge of the building are standing there. And the woman is yelling, my daughter, my daughter, Mary, Mary, my daughter's in it. So I said, well, where is she? Where? The back room, the back room, she said. So I, I I get below the heat, as I know how to do now. I go in the, the apartment. I see the couch burning. The fire's flowing up to the ceiling, rolling along the ceiling. I run to the back room. I open the door to the bedroom in the dark. I said, Mary, Mary. This kid, five years old, jumps into my arms, you know, in the dark. I, you know, so I grab her, you know, we run out wow. underneath the fire, which was, you know, rolling along the ceiling. Wow. So we shut the door and, and I got the woman, the firefighters, I, you know, you call nine yeah, they call nine mom. The officer comes up, you know, he said, it's in the it's in the, it's in the, in the left. You go in the apartment, it's right to the left. It's a chair. So they knocked the fire down. I didn't say anything to the chief, you know. I, so uh Anyway, but I went back into my apartment, and that day I said to myself, you know what? I may not be a plumber or electrician, but I do something. I now know what a firefighter does. You know? Wow. So, so that was my big, you know, you know, coming to adulthood. Wow. So I said, I don't need to be a plumber. So I know I do something that, you know, plumbers or electricians cannot, because they were frozen. They, they, they were frozen in a hallway. Like they shot right in there. You know, so, you know why? Why? Because that's what men do. That's what men that's do. What men do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. That's what we're taught to do. I mean, that's what I was taught to do. You know, if I didn't you made your first hallway, grab off duty. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was. So I know what it's like. You know, you know, I see these pictures of... Uh, uh, you know, of firefighters holding children, I know what that feels like, and it wow. is a, so. I mean, I never did it on the job, you know, officially, but I know what it's like. I know how they feel. So, uh, so that's uh, that was it. I that was a big part of my growing up and knowing yeah. what a, and I did it because I I knew I could do it, and I learned it from other firefighters. So, I chief, that, there that was not within me. It was something I was taught to do. God, there's, a, there's a comment in the in the chat that I got to read. It's a super chat. It's great, though. Uh, it's from Joe Schneiderman, and he says, Chief Dunn, 20 years ago, you graciously spoke with me at length about the Warriors for a high school paper. That paper earned an award and launched me to Fordham. Thank you. I'm sorry it took me 20 years to say it. Hmm. I thought that was great. You're out you there. You never know inspiring. who you're touching, Chief. You never know who. Well, uh, you, ne well you never know. We, you guys doing the same thing? You did you did it when you were in the job. There are guys saying, "I want to be like Kevin or Pete or Lou." You know, we don't know when guys are watching us. So, you know, that's what's good about the fire service. It creates good people mm -hmm. that younger people can can look as as role models. Yeah. No, we we're doing all that stuff. You never and that, know. And that was only twenty years, Chief. It's not like you waited sixty five years to bring back a dictionary. That was only. <laughs> That was only 20 years. <laughs> he's, he's, he's better than me. <laughs> he's better than me. <laughs> he's good. Oh, shit. Give it a clue. Oh, but it's, right, never so it's never it's, too late. It's never too late. It's never too late. late. That's, that's, five years. that's the, that's the, the yeah. theme right there. It's never too late. All right. Do we want to get it to 33 engine now where you get promoted to? Lieutenant? Okay. 
So, so uh, yeah, I guess so. I so I, uh, I get promoted, and uh, I didn't. You know, I'm covering in Brooklyn, and I didn't put in for 33 engine. In fact, I went there one night, and I there was a guy I that I had. It was oil and water. I don't know. The guy didn't like me for some reason. I was a covering lieutenant, and this guy was in nine truck, and you know for some reason. I, so, you know, you you leave a firehouse after one two. You don't know anything, and uh, you know when it comes down on the order, that <laughs> I get assigned the thirty three and nine truck. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, the one firehouse I didn't want to go to. That's a beautiful so, firehouse, right? Is that it's so lovely. Go, lovely. Oh so it's a, it's a earnest flag. It's a historic fire. But let me tell you more. So I go into the firehouse. And uh, so my first day in this firehouse that was hostile to me on this one tour. One guy was hostile. So I go in and uh, 9 o'clock. You know, we go downstairs, have a roll call, which I never had in in Harlem. So uh, they say, you, everybody comes down for a roll call. I go down there, and the guys introduce themselves to me in 33 engine. Hello, Lieutenant. My name is so-and-so. I mean, Jesus, they're shaking my hand. I mean, I thought that was very nice, you know. So there was no hostility there. So that was a good first impression. They they came up to me, you know, and they introduced themselves, and, and they were glad to see me, I guess. But, but let me tell you something. You say that's a beautiful firehouse. Well, let me tell you something. The office is a slum. The office is the worst dump <laughs> I've ever been in. You got a, it may have been different now. But when I went in there, the division had upstairs, and we were in like a, we were in like a uh, mezzanine, two offices in a filthy little office, you know, uh, you know, and it was the dirtiest, filthiest place I ever worked in. I was really disappointed. Very close quarters, you know, and sure. uh, but but anyway, the guys were good. That was really, but I was shocked that I, I had been covering a year. Every firehouse I went into the office was beautiful. This place was a dump, you know. So, uh, but anyway, well, it's 1964 <laughs> too, right? That's the year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, they got out of that office. We had the division in the firehouse, and uh, we were up in the pigeon coop, I used to call it. But anyway, and I was up there, but I met a nice, interesting guy. There was I worked, my groupie was a, a fire lieutenant, Bill Hennessy. So, uh, you know, because we were in such close quarters, you know, we got to know each other. And this guy was a kid who was older than me. He was a kid in 1939. His father was a big chief, Hennessy, in the fire department, and he was taking flying lessons. When World War II breaks out, he goes in as a, as a bomber pilot. He's 20 years old, Bill Hennessy, flying a bomber plane over England, dropping bombs, you know, in Germany, flying over in Germany. He's stationed in London and this bomber. 20 years, so now, every you know, every night after we did our drill or and we had our dinner. We'd go upstairs, and we put the late show on. It was always uh, a, a pilot World War II bomber pilot movie. We watched, you know. So I used to say, Bill, you know, and he was not interested in the fire service. I am making drills up, and you know, annoying him, <laughs> studying for the drill. And uh, so I used to say, Bill, you know, you had too much too soon. You saw too much. Too soon yeah, at 20 yeah, yeah. years old. Them out. Yeah, World yeah. War II, everything was anticlimactic to the guy, right. you know. But we got, you know, we were, he was a wonderful man. He eventually did get into the fire service, became a chief. But but he was his father was a major assistant chief. But uh, so anyway, so all right, so now I'm in 33 engine. I'm a new lieutenant, you know. Got a year covering. Don't know anybody. I we respond. Second due to 28 engine in Alphabet City. And we respond first due to Hell's 100 acres, the loft buildings over there, which is just scary to go into, period. They were all rag and uh, and paper storage buildings that collapsed. That's why it was called Hell's 100 acres. acres. But anyway, hmm. so I'm in the first couple of night tours. I go down the kitchen, 
Chow's on, go down the kitchen. So the chief's in quarters. So now I'm sitting in the kitchen with everybody and the deputy. All the guys say, gee, we're going to go downstairs, watch some TV. So the whole company goes, then engine nine and 30, 33, go down to the basement. And they've got a finished basement down there. So it's me and the deputy there, you know. So I'm saying, you know, I went after the second meal. I said, Chief, you don't mind. I'm going to go down and eat with them. I got to find out what's, you know, how they're doing down there. He said, okay, he like to eat alone anyway. So I go down to this basement down there. Well, they got a bar down there. One guy drinking hot liquor. They're eating their meal, smoking cigars. Allegedly. So, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> Jesus. So, before well, it was against well, the ranks. Before. Oh, before. All right, good. Yeah. So I said, holy crap. I, I better, I got to eat down there. I got to figure out what's going on. These guys were working there with painters. And some of them, you know, you had to pull out of bed when you got to run. Mm -hmm. You know, because they were working all day, drinking after dinner. And then, you know, they would hit the pad. So you get that one or two runs at night downtown. And they were not jumping out of that bed. Oh, boy. So I would come to the edge of my, we had balcony over the bunk room. We could look out. So who's not out of that bed yet? You know, so you'd have to go down and make sure <laughs> the guy got up and got on the rig there. So, but anyway, so uh, so that was it. So now it was a hot drinking firehouse, and I'm a new lieutenant there, and I and I'm trying to figure out how to get credibility. So one night, oh so I'm going down there smoking cigars, drinking a beer, not too many, but watching who's who's gonna make the run. So. I learned how to smoke cigars. We had a nice Limburger cheese. We got some great times down there. But uh, so I said one night, you know, I know how to make lieutenant. Is there anybody interested? Lieutenant's test was coming up. Would want to know how to be a lieutenant. So uh, and I, there was an outside chance. And believe it or not, I had been, I made the captain's test too. So I'm on the captain's list. I'm a Johnny lieutenant. <laughs> On the captain's list, and so now and you look also, like you're 12, and I look like I'm 12. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, when I said to the guy, Anybody want to? There's a lieutenant's test coming up. You want to? I know how to be a lieutenant, I know how to study. So, about five guys she say, Yeah, we'd like to do that. Okay, here's what we do. Here's what we do we come every Wednesday off duty, we come up to the top floor of the firehouse. Uh, uh, we're going to study there. If you're on duty, you come up, join us. If you don't have a run, you, you know, you, you're welcome to stay. So I, I, uh, so I got five guys. And, you know, one guy was a heavy drinker. He was like the, the boss, the leader of the drinkers down. Oh, Funny boy. guy. I, I sent him a book. I said, you're the most original, interesting, funny guy I ever met in the fire service. But anyway, this guy is very funny down there. And uh, he's a chief. I'm in. Uh, he's captain. Uh, Lieutenant, I'm in. And I noticed. He's got tattoos on his hand. Now, star, and that's unusual back in the 19, early 60s where tattoos were not in the fire department. I see this guy got tattoos on his hand. So he comes into the class. We meet every Wednesday upstairs. And this guy, there's about four of us. And, and this guy starts to clean off the table before we sit down. He starts to, he says, Lou, hey, Lou I'll pass out the cards. So he's you know, we, we, uh uh, you know, and then like every after every class, we give out assignments. One, uh, ten pages of the regulations we study. One WNYF, uh, one training bulletin, and uh, we didn't have the five hundred procedures yet. And that was it. And we had to we assigned you had to write cards three by fives, a question on the front. Answer, answer on, on the back. back, you know, and then uh, you would bring your assignment in. You put it all together, and we shoot it out, and and then you would be asking anybody's question, and you had to answer. So that's how we did it, and uh, so anyway, we were we were successful. Uh, I I eventually got promoted to captain. These guys got promoted to lieutenant. Wow! And then uh, twenty years later, I'm the division commander of the third division on 31st street. And in comes this assistant chief, you know, the Manhattan Borough Command was relocated up to my division quarters. 
and it's the guy with the tattoos. No way. He's the power command, my boss. That's so, wow. um, That was funny. So, needless to say, you know, I got along well with Eddie, you know. That's yeah. awesome. So that was, do, uh, do you want to get into the 23rd Street fire now, Chief? Yeah, okay. So, I was just, anyway, uh, so uh, while I'm down in 33 engine, You know, we get, uh, you know, it was not Hell's on Acres, but it was pretty close, close by. But it was on, uh, we get a box. Uh, all hands working at box 598. We respond to the apparatus floor. We're a second do, we're, we're first do on a second alarm. Uh, the housewife says, okay, so we're listening. And then it says, uh, transmit the second alarm. Okay, so we respond. We're well, first do on a second alarm. <clears throat> the fire is on 22nd Street. I think it's on 6th East, 22nd. So right off, right off Broadway. So uh, I run, we run up. I report to this Chief Goebbels, Harry Goebbels. He's an assistant chief in front of the fire building. Don't ask me how assistant chief. Did. So I said, 33, ready, you know, reporting in. You stand fast. I look, there's a brownstone building there. Heavy flame and fire is coming out underneath the stairway, the stoop leading to the parlor floor. Yeah, and rescue one's got the line, and they are not going anywhere. They're not going down that. They can't make any headway with a two and a half inch hose. So we're watching this. So Goebbels says he's on the radio. We don't have radios. Goebbels says 30, 33. Run around to 23rd Street, report to Chief Riley, 3rd Division. I, we think these buildings are connected. So my company and I run around to 23rd Street. We report in Riley standing in front of the Wonder Drugstore and Faye's Lingerie and uh, a candy store. So, so Fans Lingerie and a candy store. So it was a Wonder Drugstore, a lingerie store, and a candy store. And they were, it was a big 60 by 100 building with three stores in it. So I report to Riley. I'm on his right side. Just stand fast. I see Joe Priori. I knew 18 inch. He comes up, reports to his left side. He says, stand fast. Riley's there waiting to see what to do. You look in the drugstore. There's nothing there. It's a wisp of smoke. The lights are on. There's nothing there. Heavy fire is around 22nd Street. So uh, out comes an old fire patrolman. And, and he says, Jake, we got five. We just found smoke around the baseball. It's in the back of the drugstore. So uh, Riley turns to me, says, 33 engine, get a line in explosion number two, 18 engine, get a line to the drugstore. So uh, I see Riley walk in. I see Jack Finley from Seven Truck throwing on a mask. He walks in. I look in. Uh, the light whisper smoke. I said to Eddie Butler, it's nothing here. Let's get around where the action is. So we head around to get a hose line, and we meet up with uh, the first two chief uh uh, White, her, her, Harry White, I think his name was White, 6th Battalion. Yeah, first do that. So he says, 33, I'm going to exposure two, which is the 940 Broadway building. So White says, follow me. I know, I, I know where we can hit this fire. So we stretch a two and a half inch line up to the second floor of this big commercial building. He says, get, get forceful empty tools. We force open the bathroom door in the hallway. There's a frosted uh, window glass leading into the to a shaft from this building. Now you can see brightness. I'm now back. I thought I saw a light behind there, and then uh, I thought I heard something. I and then there's like a flash of the light. That's what I behind frosted glass. And then somebody yells up, "Get out of the building! Evacuate that building!" Somebody yells up to the second floor. So uh, we we back out. Uh, we take the two and a half inch line out, Chief White and 33 engine. <clears throat> now I do remember, we don't know anything that's going on. So we're outside now. And I remember the, the building on Broadway now, <clears throat> this is exposure too, technically. Uh, I'm looking, the windows actually pulsating, you know, <clears throat> you, know you know, like if, as a, if fire was like rolling in a, all I know is there's stained glass. It was stained, dripping 
with con condensation. I swore it was pulsating. So uh, we got yeah, we got we got water. Thirty three yeah, we got water. They break the window, flame comes out. We hit the fire. So then we're doing that, and then all of a sudden, all right, watch out. We got the, the super pumper. It starts to hit the upper floors of this commercial building on Broadway. <clears throat> and then it must have been about midnight, you know. We're standing there with a hose line, throwing water on the building. And then a chief comes up and he said, anybody see Riley? Anybody see Chief Riley? I said, yeah, I reported to Riley. What time is that? It's about, must have been about 10, 15. You know, I, we reported in. Goebbels told us to report. Okay, 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 no, never mind. Now they realize that 12 guys are missing. You know? Oh, my God. And, uh, it was not, you know. That's a long time. It was a lot of confusion in this in this particular fire initially. You know, I'm sure somebody knew, but we didn't know, and nobody at the fire knew. So, so to reconstruct what I learned, and I reread the, the Board of Inquiry report, which is very good. What happened was, Riley was a pretty good, he was a very good, excellent veteran, third division, midtown deputy chief. So when he, he, he knows he's got big fire on 22nd Street, he goes around to 23rd Street. They uh, go to the one, the drugstore, the only access to the cellar is, and they know they got a cellar fire on 20, is inside the drugstore, an interior cellar stand, in, right in the doorway down to the cellar. There's an outside cellar entrance, but it was not working. There was no outside entrance to the cellar. It was only an inside Entrance. So Riley, a smart chief, gets five engine, you know, and three truck go down to the cellar. Let me know what you got down there. Three truck goes down there. Royal Fox, funny name of a guy. He's a lieutenant, and he just survived a Broadway collapse where three guys died trapped in the cellar. So he had savvy. So Royal Fox is a lieutenant in uh, three truck. So they go down there. And they go 60 feet back into the cellar. Uh, the cellar, the building is 90 feet deep. What happened was the guy on 22nd Street had a frame uh, shop selling art frames and drums of lacquer and dinner that he used to paint the, dream, the frames with down in the basement. He, business was so good, he took over 30 feet of the cellar of the drugstore. They sold him the cellar. He broke the wall, the original wall down. They built a new cinder block wall in the cellar of the one that drug 30, 60 feet back. Now there were 30 feet was where the fire was burning with the drums of lacquer and varnish. So uh, Royal Fox goes back, he goes down there with five engine and they go to the see this nice new wall, pull the ceiling. Chief, we got a little fire here, no problem here. So they got the line here and they're ready to do their thing. So when they go down there, Royal Fox is smart. He says to this fellow, Nick Cicero, uh, five engine, you stay by the top of this wooden stairway because he got trapped in a fire in Broadway. He says, you stay there and tell us if things get bad here. Uh, so, and he moved these boxes off the stairway in case we got to get out of here quickly. So there's storage box. Cicero is moving the storage boxes. So now they're down there. So now in comes Riley, Jack Finley, to look at the back of the smoke coming out of the of the drugstore in the back basement. <clears throat> so they pass Cicero. They go to the back. Uh, they've got seven truck back there, 18 engine back there. They're looking around the baseboard for this fire. They're standing over the fire and burning in the basement on a terrazzo floor, five inch thick of concrete, which they can't feel the springing is, it's insulating the heat that's tremendous down in the basement. And all of a sudden, big chunk of the uh, Truraza floor collapses with 10 of the firefighters in there. When the floor collapses, a big ball of fire rushes out of the first floor, engulfs Cicero, <clears throat> he starts to yell, get out, get out, something's wrong down there, get out. Now the two drivers, they're trapped, they're trying to, the 10, 10 guys go down there. Uh, the two drivers are trying to get out there. They're engulfed in fire on each side of the ball of fire. 
that comes out. Cicero, they're able to crawl out. Now there's eight guys down in the basement. Fire's blowing out the front door of the drugstore. So uh, now they, they, they go to the stairway. They don't want to go up the stairway. Royal Fox has been through this, and they were trapped in a fire similar in Broadway. He says, you got to get out. He starts to push them up. He pushes all these guys up. The eight firefighters, they crawl out underneath the fire. They're burned. They're rolling around the street, you know. And, uh, you know, the, so they think they got everybody out, but there's 12 guys dead in there. So that's what added to the confusion. You know, we lost two chiefs drivers, two chiefs, uh, two company officers, and six firefighters. Uh, they died in that collapse. So, so that was it. Now, you know, again, I was, I did not see it. Uh, we stay. We got the word. We stayed there. We were digging in the basement, trying to get breach the wall to get in the cellar. We retrieved the bodies. We stood outside. Everybody came down to help, you know, and we got the 12 uh, bodies out. And then we were released. And I remember in the daytime, whatever time it was that afternoon, I go home. You know, I go home and again, you know, I jump into bed. I'm tired. My three-year-old daughter comes jumping into bed with me. She cuddles up with me, you know, and I remember saying, well, there's going to be a lot of kids who don't have dads to wow. yeah. So I fell asleep, you know. So now I fell asleep. I woke up the next day. You know, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't think. I didn't bat an eye. You know, I mean, you know, I went to the, you know, next day I went to work. I went into, we went to the funeral. There were ceremonies in 18 inch, and I went to, and I really wasn't affected. Of course, I was on the captain's test. I wanted to be a battalion chief. I had, you know, I wanted things, and I didn't let it bother me. You know, of course, 12 years later, I'm up in the seventh division as a deputy chief, and I can't stop thinking about building collapse. I can't stop writing about building collapse. You know, I got a camera. I'm taking pictures of building collapse in the Bronx. You know, and I start to, you know, uh, you know, I Dennis Smith lets me write for his magazine, and my first my first article was in WNYF. I wrote for WNYF, ten or fourteen articles, you know, and I kept writing about collapse, fire escape collapse, you know, parapet wall collapse, renovated building collapse, you know, I mean, I, so even when I started writing for Firehouse Magazine, the editor says, "Vin, you got to stop writing about the collapse." I said, "I can't stop writing." So. So I, I'm home, I'm writing, I'm talking to my wife. I'm saying, Pat, I just feel like I'm vomiting this stuff up. I can't stop it. It, it was the words were just coming out uncontrollably. So uh, now I realize that was a delayed, you know, uh, post-traumatic stress going on. And it was uh, like somebody said to me, my wife said to me, you were probably exercising your demons you know, 12 years later that you didn't address all those right. years. You know, we didn't have stress debriefing back right, then. You didn't have counseling. You didn't have, didn't have counseling. Yeah. No counseling. It's funny. Nope. When, you know, one day I'm down, I'm in the Dublin, Ohio on a stage talking about building collapse. I wrote the book. It had to be after I wrote my collapse of Bernie Billing. And then actually at that time, it must have been like 88, 89, stress debriefing became very popular. It was 89, 90 in the fire service. And, you know, and I'm up in the state talking about the new stress debriefing that we have in the fire service now. You know, and I say to, to the audience, you know, <clears throat> if, I guess if, if I had stress debriefing back in the 60s, I would not have written this book, Collapse of Burning Building. And then it dawned on me. That was probably true. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, But uh, anyway, I was lucky and I didn't have any, I don't think I had any debilitating. I was, I was a little bit of a wild man you know, in my social life, but I tried to control that. You know, I look back, I think every fire, I don't think it was just that far. I think every firefighter is under tremendous stress. And I, and my experience has been most firefighters are like time bombs. You know, they, their work is so stressful. They don't realize it, but they can explode at any moment. And firefighters have an extra edge of, of, uh, of, whatever it is, aggression, uh, explosiveness in their personality, 
It's because of the nature of our work, I believe. But it's not just people who see things. It's just firefighters doing that job. It's a very stressful job, and we don't address it, and we laugh about it. But I think, well, we're all time bombs. That's it. So uh, mm. we do need this. And I, later on, I went to stress people over a personal issue with my son. But uh, nothing to do with the fire department. But so it's good. It helps. Yeah, I like to talk. That's why I'm going to be a good interview. I love <laughs> my, wife, my wife doesn't like to talk. But I perfect. love talking. Gets it off my chest. Yeah, yeah. I'm the same way. I, I want to ask you one hold on, question. Hold on. Okay, 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 cool. No, I was going I to say, ask... like... <laughs> no, wait. But, but... I'm going to ask okay. a quick question. It's about the 23rd Street fire. So uh, I had read or I had been told a story that uh, one of the guys from 18 was out on summons duty. And... Uh, so he didn't respond with 18 at the time. And um, when he went back to quarters, he realized that they were at a run where they were. He went to the job, followed the hose line in, and fell into the to the collapse, but held on to the held on to the bail of a nozzle. Do you know about that story, Chief? That's true. I, 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 is that Manny Fernandez? I mean, it might Manny Fernandez. No, it's, was... it's a guy named Jackie Donovan because he grew up with my father. So he okay. He... All right, that's true. I mean, I know that. You know. Uh, you know, that the, there was a big, you know, flawed gun. And and he definitely fell in the hole, and he, they pulled him out uh, with the hose line. Wow. And that's yeah. a true story. Right. I mean, there was a lot of confusion there. We were in there searching. We didn't know the two dead firemen were on the side, you know, in the corner, you know, drivers trying to run out. Uh uh, I know the guy from Nine Truck, Bill Hennessy. I went in, I looked down there, never thinking, you know, I guess they thought the guys who tumbled out were the right. survivors, not realizing right. there were 12 other missing firefighters until they put two and two together, you know. But there was a lot of, as most, <laughs> you know, today it's better. You know, we got greater accountability. The yeah, there's no, yeah, there's yeah. no radio no radio for them to give a major. No radios, no, 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 right. No, right. Chiefs yeah. had radios. So, Communications were, I mean, my parents knew there was a collapse listening to WINS before I knew, you know, at the fire. Yeah, yeah, so, right. uh, and then, and then another important point at a fire for firefighters too is you may be in the back of a building and you don't know what happened in the front of a building. The wall could have collapsed. I have had guys say to me, I'm operating in the back. I never knew that the front wall collapsed. You know, uh, we don't, you know, communicate. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know, we, we think, well, like Shazam, everybody knows what's going on in a fire. No, fire is a complex thing that has many parts. And if you're down the basement, you don't know what's going on in the roof. Or in the roof, you don't know what's going on on the intermediate floors. So <clears throat> even on the fire ground. And the battlefield's the same way. You know, it's chaos, you know, until things calm down. Who's right. with you? Who isn't right, there? Right, 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 and, right. Uh, you know, that's how it is. And that's certainly how, how it was on the 23rd Street Fire. Chief, how did you? What 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 stuck out to me there is, and I don't I don't know if you've talked about this before. I mean, the decision that the chief made: you go left, you, and these guys went into the building, right? Depending on where he sent you. If he would have sent you into the drugstore, right, it could have so, it could have so, been you, right? One line, many many years later, I'm a deputy in the third division, so uh, I I liked uh, chaplain. You know, when I go down the third division, I came from the Bronx, <clears throat> Harlem, and I get assigned to the third division. And I know this St. Francis chaplain hangs out down there. I said, Jesus, I don't want to go into a firehouse with a chaplain. You know, I know about firehouses. So uh, I go down there and there's a Father Julian Deacon is the fire department chaplain there. So, I mean, once you went in there, he was like a regular firefighter person. Everything went, you know, Jules, as they called him, was a sweetheart of a guy. <clears throat> he was before Father Mike. <clears throat> but uh, so anyway, I'm down there and one night I'm just talking, well, you know, we're talking about everything. And I said to Father Jules, I said, uh, you think God was looking at us that night, you know, and, so, and saying, I'm with me and Riley and Pry Joe Prayer. You think God said, I'm going to let that firefighter, fire officer die and save that fire officer on the right, because he's going to write a book on building collapse. Mm. So Jules said to me, God wouldn't, he got angry, he got pissed. God would never let a fire officer die. <laughs> You know, so I said, you know, that was a good answer to a stupid question. 
<laughs> but but I did think about that. But uh, so so that was it. I and then another thing about that fire. If you take a look at the guys in that picture, uh, I mean, you know, I keep thinking about the twelve firefighters who died. You know, one of them, I think Rudy. We have Kaminsky, we have the picture, Chief. We'll put it was, up. Rudy Kaminsky was was in. Uh, uh, I saw a boy. I came on a job with him. Uh, he was driving. But, but but my point was, that night, I, I think about the 12 guys who died. When you read their bio, like Walter Higgins was a brain. All his kids went to, you know, Yale, Harvard. You know, Riley's, you know, two of the executives and, you know, officers in the military. So, uh, uh, but my guys, the guys in 33 Engine that night, you know, we did great. I mean, I became a division commander in the third division where Riley mm. was working when he died. Eddie Butler was a fireman with me that night. He became the Manhattan Borough Commander. Frank Lombardi was a fireman with me that night. He became the 11th Division Commander. Gabe Abernathy became the 37th Battalion Commander. So, you know, what, what would those 12... Fire Joe Priori, Joe Priori, Walter Higgins. They said he was on a deputy's test. He had a college degree. These guys were World War II heroes. They would have been superstars in the fire service had they lived. So the guys who did live like 33 Engine, our company, you know, we really became leaders in the fire service, you know. So uh, what about those guys in 18 Engine, Joe Priori, and uh, the guys who died in 7 Truck? They would have been superstars, could have been superstars. So you never know. Yep. So you yep. did it, you did it right, Chief. You you and the guys from 33. You uh you 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 lived a good life. You guys did what you had to do. You you, you moved up on the job and you uh I'm fight, I'm fight you about the form does the you know, let me tell you something. Everything I got no did was formed by the FDNY. I did nothing. <laughs> You know, it was the guys I worked with, the role models I connected with. I owe my whole life, my family's life, and their their lives to the FDNY. We are creatures of the FDNY. Your, your uh, Getting Salty program is a result of the FDNY. It all comes down to, you know, the FDNY. That created all of us. So I don't take any credit, and I don't give any credit to the guys in 33, I give all that credit to the, the FDNY, the fire department. Dennis Smith said, I'm FDNY trained. I could do anything. Exactly. As my, exactly. One of my favorite lines, he said. Exactly. Exactly. Sure. Years, years later, he said, I think yeah. he was telling his daughter or something. He said the same thing. He says, whatever it is, I can handle it because I'm FDNY trained. FDNY, yeah, yeah. That's so amazing. I agree. God bless it you. Is, uh, it makes us good people. It makes us good people. And yeah. Dennis, was, Dennis was a good person. Absolutely. Uh, let's see if I got another question here before we go to the captain's rank here. Actually, uh, you mind if I, while you're looking for that, you mind if I hit one from these super chats? Yeah, hit it, brother. Yeah. So we have a uh, a friendly super chatter here uh, who's asking, MCs is asking, Chief, in your 2002 report on the collapse of the WTC was a landmark look at response to mm. high-rise fire. Mm. If you could make any amendments to it 20 years later, what would it be if, if you changed anything? Well, I mean, like all I can say is I should have read John O'Hagan's book closer. I had no clue that that building would collapse. I, uh, with all my collapse study and research, you know, O'Hagan – had the lightweight Bardurus trusses pictured in his book, uh, Fire and Life Safety, but I didn't pay that much attention to it. Uh, it was a tragedy, you know. I, I, I didn't think it would collapse like that. Uh, give me the question again. Give me that. I can answer that better. Give you me that. Saying, what could, would you? What would you change yeah. if there if was? If you could change that anything, what would you change in the book? Yeah, yeah, that was it. Well, you know. Well, I, I tried to look at how, you know, we were fooled, first of all, by the prior 93 bombing. 
the substructure of that building was stunning. Big steel uh, right, beams right, right, and column. Right. We all bragged about it. But the superstructure was another story. The superstructure was lightweight, flimsy, radically <laughs> different construction with tubular bearing walls, lightweight bar joists. That was destined to collapse. That was not any high-rise structural steel building in New York City or the nation. That was a very different construction, destructive building. The leap to lightness, they called it. I mean, we did our job. You know, like they used to say to me, oh, what would you change in, in the high-rise procedures? Nothing. You know, the high-rise procedures worked. The building failed. So, you know, our firefighting high-rise procedures are fine. You know, they're still fine. It's the best way, uh, the, uh, the best procedure to fight high-rise fire. But there was nothing wrong with our firefighting. It was the building collapse. Mm. That was something wrong with the building. So what could I change? I mean, I'd love to warn them, but I didn't know. You know, when I looked at the fire, I see that. Holy jeez. I didn't know a plane hit it. I saw the smoke. I said, this fire is going to burn for days. I knew high-rise building fires burn a long right, time. Right, right, right. I said, well, they're doing a, a non-attack strategy. They got the door to the fire floor closed. They're going above, you know, removing the people down past the fire. I said, that's the strategy. It's all they can do. Then I see another plane, another building. And then I go home and I said, let me, let me, I had a WNY, I uh, had a uh, fire engineering article about the 93 bombing and, and it talked about the construction. And then when I read that article and I read about the construction, then I understand, I stood how that building fell down. It was a very flimsy, lightweight, constructed building. To get it so high, they removed all the mass of that building. You know, strut, trusses, tubular bearing walls, right. it was a joke. The building yeah, construction yeah, yeah. was a joke. So, and so, it, so it that's basically what you would change, sir. It's just the, you know, just your understanding of the situation and having now read uh, O'Hagan's work and all that. There were, there were, there's nothing you could do. There really was nothing we could do. I mean, when those planes slid through right. across those the whole floors, side. Right. cut everything, side. we did our job. We we do what we do. We go now. Another controversy. A guy says to me, guy says to me, why did you have so many people in that? Why did you have sent so many firefighters in those buildings? I said, wait a minute. When you have a six-story tenement up in Harlem or the Bronx, uh, you probably have uh, four people a floor, 6, 12, 18, 24, 25, maybe 30 people in the building of a tenement. And when they have a fire there, we send three engines, uh, four engines and two trucks. So we send like, that's 20, we send 50 firefighters to a, to a, to a tenement that has maybe 30 people at an all hands. So we sent 343 people we, into that building to save 2,000, uh, 20, uh, 10,000, uh, 3,000 people died. So, right. so there, there was no uh, problem with the, the number of commitment that, that we had there of firefighters to the number of rescues we could have made. So we did our procedures perfectly. It was the terrorist right. attack. You know, it was the building was already compromised. Forget about the heat, right, but the right. building was already compromised. Exactly. So, so we, you know, we did everything. And of course, what I what I do know is that you know, I was in the fire service yeah you know, for forty years before that fire, and I tell in that book, uh, the night I go down, I decide to go to this third division. I want to go down and see this place. So I go to the third division on 77th Street. I get in a cab with <clears throat> the chief of the third division. And every night they have a convoy going down to the World Trade Center from uptown Manhattan. So we get in a vehicle. We start down on the West Side Highway. When we get to 50th Street, below 50th Street, there's thousands of people winding the West Side Highway. 
with flowers and water right, bottles. Flags and, and everything, and right? Flags, waving, crying, cheering us. Holy God. We go down. I can't look at them. I never saw anything like this in my life. From 50th Street down to the, the World Trade Center, it was like Romans coming into Rome after a battle. Right. Now, uh, I couldn't look at the people. I couldn't look at the chief driving. We went down. I never saw anything like that. But I do know that the death of those 343 firefighters put us on the map. Those people did not know what the fire service did. They didn't care what we did. Uh, that tragedy, when those firefighters lost their lives, you know, made us all heroes. You know, we are now glorifying in the, basking in the glory that they earned us. Now, now everybody understands what the fire service does. We, you know, we, we give ourselves to, you know, like, like Walter Wilkinson said to this angry guy in an elevator in the Bronx, Firefighters are the closest thing to Jesus you will find in most. <laughs> That's <laughs> it in a nutshell. So, now, now the public realizes that. No doubt. Wow. No doubt about it. Huh. Yep. Uh, I don't remember what question I had after that. You, you just, uh, you, you stymied me. You Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Sorry, that, you know I blame MCs for that out of uh, out of that's control okay. sideways question. You know that's okay. Oh, that's that's style, though. No, it makes you reach. No, there's no out of sort. You know, I'll take bad questions. You know, there's no <laughs> such thing as a. You know, it makes us. Well, good thing you're on our show, Chief. We got tons of those for you. I know. I'll take. Give me a couple. I can. I, I'd like to see if I can handle. I think I can handle. Uh, there's a couple of places in the book. Are these kind of the same? Types of points. You said college showed you the whole job as opposed to what you were no. seeing. Here's, here's what happened. Here's what happened to me. I'm uh, 21 years old. 20, Frank Lemuskio has me going to Queens College. And, um, you know, so we start to go down, take courses. Down. I'm taking courses and um, being taught by Chief of Third Division Charlie Walsh. High rise fires. Lou Harris is talking about marine fires. Uh, we're talking about uh, airplane fires, uh, strategy, tactics, you know. And I'm going back into the firehouse, learning how to survive a tenement, stretch holes, raise ladders, and tenement fire. Now, there's two different worlds. I was learning a macro world of the big chiefs as a 21 year old kid. And nobody was doing that back in 19, <clears throat> back in 1959, 1960. John Jay hadn't existed. Today, young kids can go to college and get this macro world about strategy right, and tactics. Right, right. But you've got to learn right. the micro world about survival in a firehouse, how to put out a fire, how to keep from getting killed in a building. So, so I was at those two worlds that it going back and forth. And so that, you know, that set me on, you know, after I got my, my I had to get 64 credit for an associate's degree. Then 34, 30 something, 32 were fire courses, which I got A's and B's. And the other, I had to take Queens College required courses, physics and math, English, language, all that stuff. So uh, to get my degree. So then I started taking, you know, education courses, which were very difficult. I got to see most of them courses, you know, but I, I had to restudy what I didn't learn in high school. So, so that was uh, what I was up against, the macro and a micro world. Right. And uh, so, so that was it. And it's good. I, so I would advise young firefighters at the end, what, what, am, what is my advice to young, go to school, get a college degree, take a fire science course, see what those big chiefs are talking about. And, 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 uh, and also most important, more important is to learn the micro world of the firefighting in the firehouse. But you've so got I'm gonna, to do I'm gonna segue into this question then chief, because you also talked about how going on the circuit and, and lecturing opened your eyes to the volley, which showed you the volleys, which showed you a different side of the job. Okay, so so when I I never got 
and of course, I didn't know how to do any lectures. But after I wrote that book, I got started getting calls to, to do lectures. Uh, and and all of my calls to do lectures were in volunteer uh, company. Now, uh, Firehouse Magazine, their main audience is a volunteer fire company. So, so these guys were reading about me in 1981 when I started writing for Dennis and Firehouse. In 88, when I had my book out by Fire Engineering, I got calls to go do lectures. They were all from volunteer fire companies. They wanted to know about this collapse. Now, I rarely, I don't remember getting a call from a, a, a paid a city fire department. Paid city fire departments, Chicago, New York, Philly, they got their own guys and they know, they think they know everything, you know, and they know a lot more than most of us, but they don't know everything. The volunteers are open to, to, to learning new things. They were more open to what I had to deliver and I learned a lot from the volunteers. You know, they know about the, you know, they were, you know, with my nozzle story, they had that constant flow nozzle, fog nozzle before we did. And they knew about positive pressure ventilation. You know, they have great, they, you know, they have great innovation in the volunteer. In fact, the, uh, the big old cities are very hard to change. They're like the aircraft carrier. They don't change direction fast. Those volunteers are, are at the top of the cutting edge of the fire service. They know what's new and they expect you to know. And I had to keep up, you know, uh, you know, learning what they knew. So they were very welcoming. I didn't know if they would understand uh, what I had to say. And they did. They have a room in fire. You know, you realize it doesn't matter the height of the building. It still breaks down to a room and fire, and uh, so I, I thank the volunteers. You know, they they were and actually when you take a look at it, there's a there was a million three firefighters. There's only three hundred thousand paid guys. There's a most of the fire service right, 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 is right. volunteer. So you got to realize that's the American fire service. And they're you running know. in with three guys. <laughs> yeah, they're running with. They're doing with hat tricks and mirrors, as they used That's to say. That's it, exactly. They have to do everything, you know. And they, and they, you know, sometimes they ridicule us. Look at all these guys you got. So, uh, and we specialize. <laughs> so, you know, the I, my hats off to the volunteers. They, they do the job, and uh, and, and we are, you know, a lot of times we're that we do their training schools, but they now they are running with their own instructors they're they're cutting edge and they're right up there with the they are the fire service you got to realize that is the fire we are not the fire service it's the volunteers of america are the are the fire service yeah, they and get we, the equipment before we do too. they get most of the equipment they, before we do well they always have the equipment that's the joke <laughs> you know when they have a fire they get nine beautiful fire trucks i got the and cash eight, and eight firefighters you know they don't have the staffing but uh, no they've got and they know about fire trucks. Like one time, I'm, I'm giving a lecture, and uh, the guy, Chief, what kind of rig you got here? What kind of rig you got here? And one of the volunteers, uh, he's, he was he knew he was a New York buff. He says to the guy, "This guy doesn't know anything about fire apparatus. Don't ask him about that. He is asking him about fires." So it was true. I mean, some guys know a lot about fire apparatus. I don't. Yeah, we, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about fires either, but I, it's not. No, I you get the water out of the lake. I, I told them, you know, you go around to the firehouses and, and right. you, know, you have a roll call. The guy says, hey, Chief, why don't we have this? Why don't we have this? I said, Look, nice. let me tell you something. All you can be guaranteed is a fire truck, hose, and your paycheck. Don't ask the fire to anything other than that. As long yeah. as you get your paycheck and you got a fire truck to, to respond to and, and hose or ladders, that's it. Don't ask or, for anything. Or, or maybe a captain that uh, somehow swaps and, and gets a fox nozzle somehow and keeps it in his pocket or something like that. Oh, yeah, well, well, the big story, you know, the big, see, <laughs> see, there's a big controversy. Fire service loves the controversy. And he keeps saying, oh, solid, I, solid bore over fog. I've been down this. I was a captain when this started. Uh, so, yeah, the solid bore is a demolition nozzle. It's good, plenty of water. Yeah. You know, 13, 15, 16, whatever the hell it is, you get uh, 280 gallons, three quarters of a ton, 
you go in. That's a very good nozzle. I got nothing wrong with that. But so I'm a new captain. And I say, you know, this nozzle was invented about 1860. You know, put a control. And now all, all the volleys out in, out in, in Long Island have these FT2 combination uh, uh, constant flow nozzles. Now, the wrap against the fog nozzle is that you don't get the flow that you get out of a solid bore nozzle. And I, I was burned at a fire because we had a two and a half inch Navy, Navy fog nozzle, which had a solid portion and a fog stream, and they were using the fog stream, which only gave you 90 gallons of water out of this two and a half inch ton, a two and a half inch hose with a Navy fog nozzle. So the wrap against fog was you didn't get the water you got out of the smooth bore. But that was solved with the constant flow combination, solid and fog. When you get the FT2 nozzle, you got 180 in solid, 180 in fog, you know, so they solved that real deficit of fog nozzle that didn't give you enough water. So you, but you had to use it right. If you didn't use it right, you got burned. It was a thinking man's nozzle. If you had it in fog and you went into a flat without ventilation, it was going to blow back on you burned. So you had to use it in solid stream to go into that apartment and put the fire out. And then what I would do after we put the fire out, I would go to a window in the smoke and steam, and then we would bring the fog nozzle over and put it on white pattern fog, and boom, you'd get all the smoke and heat out of the yeah, yeah, and nice get visibility. Yeah. You know, so of course, in the in that book I write, one day I'm on a building a vacant building on Lenox Avenue, and we knocked the fire down. I'm the captain. You know, so we're in there, quick knockdown. So I go in the smoke and blinding the smoke, and steam. And I, I used to always have my knee out. So a windowsill is about three feet high, an average windowsill. So my knee would hit the windowsill, and you know, before the window was there above it. So this one, I'm going, sliding my foot with my knee bent, looking for the window, you know. And uh, going to call the nozzle man over with the FT fog nozzle to put fog and vent the room. As I'm going, sliding my foot over to the looking for a window, a gust of wind blows into the room, and I'm standing looking down at a four-story dark alleyway. Had I taken one more inch oh, step, yeah. I would have tumbled out that. It was a double wide window. So I would have tumbled right out that window. One of the factors with Tommy Williams dying in Rescue 4, he was looking for a window. They had vented, and he was going towards the window. That was an 18-inch sill that he tripped over and went out. <clears throat> so, so that was all. That was so. But the fog, they, so, how, how I, so the, answer, the answer to your question is, so I'm a young captain. These guys in the, the volley's got these FT2 fancy-looking nozzles that have constant flow. Now, I don't want to carry a fog tip in my turnout gear. Well, I have to, when I get an oil burn, if I send the guy back for a uh, fog tip so we can put out an oil fire. I wanted to get the FT2 combination nozzle that gave me the 180 gallons in solid stream. And then when I got an oil fire, put it in fog and... <coughs> Put the oil fire out. <laughs> so, uh, so I see this captain in the volunteer company in Nassau. I think it was um, anyway. So he said to me, Chief uh, uh, Captain, I'll make a deal with you. You get me thirty of those ice shields from your shops, and I'll give you an FT two nozzle. We'll trade. <laughs> so I go down to the, the store, and I order thirty Bork ice shields. You know, everybody wanted them on the helmets, and they protected your eyes. So. Uh, I bought them. I gave them to the captain of the Nassau County uh, Fire Department. He gave me an FT2 nozzle. So we used that FT2 nozzle. And of course, it almost got me killed, you know, going to that window trying to vent it. But uh, <laughs> a hell of a price to pay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, but, uh, oh, but so then, so then during the, during the, one of the strikes, you know, we, you know, we were, 
and I had a very aggressive nozzle man who saved my life many times. Uh, he got burned too many times. So the Manhattan Borough Commander, Fogarty, gave an order in Manhattan, no more fog nozzles, get rid of them. So I had to get rid of them. And we went back to the to the, uh, the open floor. So the 1860s. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 1860s, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but, so anyway, so that's it. Kevin, so, uh, what were we talking about the uh, the magic carpet? Well, where did that come in? I was remember that the chief he, said. Uh, once he got on the job, he started his magic carpet ride of his career. Well, another time, well, in the, in the last chapter in the book, you know, one of the last chapters, I'm I'm sitting in the firehouse of uh, the third division on 77th Street. My last tour at night, my last night tour. I'm looking out the window, snowing out. I'm looking across the room, the 77th Street. There's a big, heavy timber brick building there. Snow is glaring off the street light. And I said, my, this is my last tour in a fire department, night tour. And I said, you know what? <clears throat> Somebody looked out this window, had those little yeah, funny yeah, things. Yeah, 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 in yeah. 19, the house was built in 1902. I said, somebody, some officer looked out this window in uh, 1914. When we went into World War One, and uh, and then some officer looked out the window in 1930s when we, we went into the major depression, you know, and then some officer looked out these same windows, uh, 1941 when we went into World War Two, and now I'm 1999, and I'm looking out these windows, and uh, they didn't know what was going to be their life. And I didn't, I don't know what's going to be my life. But two things came to me on that last tour. Uh, one was, it was a magic carpet ride. My life, I mean, some guys have had different experiences. They had tragedies in the job, in the death. So I, I don't minimize that. But my life was a magic carpet ride. The fire department, I rode on a fire department's magic carpet. And... <clears throat> I was passing through, like everybody else, like we all passed through, you know. So these were the two things I thought of that night, that it was a magic carpet right for me, and I was just passing through, like all those guys in 1914, 19, passing through, 30, and 1941. So leave it better than you find it, right, Chief? What? Leave it better than you find it. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's now you're stealing my last. Uh, oh, is it? Oh, you're leaving me. You're stealing my, you know. Your eight, thunder. Uh, my uh, tip of the day. Old school tip. Yeah, my last tip. You know, I'm gonna say that. You know, are we you ready for that? You know, I mean, uh, you know what? I think we should stop here and then pick up from captain to deputy on part two. On part two, exactly. I like it. Are you all right with well, that, Chief? Yeah, De Dennis what went like this when he was ready. Yeah. Oh, Dennis, Smith. Wrap it up. Dennis Smith gave one of these. Right. Wrap it up. <laughs> wrap it up. He said, I don't know how long you last. If I do this, it means wrap it up, he said. I <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm fine. I'm fine. Love but, but it is good. It's two hours. That was two hours. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was two hours. So, so, so what we'll do is we'll pick up from Captain fine. when he goes to, uh, love, love the, to do it the, again. The, fire, the fire factory. Uh, yes. Actually, when we, when we go into the post show, we'll pick a date. That way we have it. We won't let you go. Fine. Um, so, shall I, Kev? Yes. It. It's time for the old school tip of the day. 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 Chief, you're on. Okay. And what I would say, what I would tell a, firefighter, a new firefighter is first of all, study, get promoted. And the fire service is so complex now, uh, you can't learn it all. So what you have to do is make a lieutenant or captain and then specialize in one aspect of the fire service and then teach that aspect of the fire service. You know, and then as my friend said, we all have a responsibility to leave the job better than it was when we entered it. Now, you know, so you take one aspect of the fire service become an expert at that because there's so much of it. Like I did collapse and then you spend the rest of your career teaching. One of the things I want to talk about is this guy, Nick Pepper, the guy coordinating ventilation. You know, it was something we all talk about, how you have to coordinate venting with the hose line advance. 
This guy took that, wrote a book about it, and now goes around the country lecturing about coordinating ventilation. Nick Papa, you know. So how many other subject matters that are there that you can choose from, become an expert in it, and then go around and lecture, you know, the new firefighters and explain to them about it. So that's all. Become a lieutenant or captain or a firefighter and, and, and specialize. The main thing is specialize in something because our, our job is too big now. Specialize it, become an expert in it, and then become a, a philosopher. Go around and teach it. That's what I would advise new firefighters to do. I like it, Chief. Right. My, ca my captain, when I was in 117, he ended up becoming a battalion chief. Mm -hmm. um, he said, if you're not studying, you ain't. You're not moving up. You know what I mean? Like even even if you don't become lieutenant, just just reading the book makes you a better makes fire. You a better fire. Makes you a better fire. I mean, we, but but you got you got you got to think about it. My father-in-law loved being a fireman. And guys, I know guys that just love being a fire. I know guys love being a captain. That's the that's the real job. That that's the captain, the rank that runs the job. You know, some I wanted to be a deputy. Don't ask me why. I saw this guy Griffin come into the fire one day with all gold on. I said, I want to be like that. That's this, me. This, Jerry said to me about me, you know, so it, but you don't have to be a chief. You, a firefighter is, you know, lieutenant, captain. Uh, I think Nick Papa is a lieutenant, you know, in the, in the, uh, in, a, in a fire service somewhere. But so that's all. Become an expert. That's the main. Take one phase of it and, and know it well. And then go down to fire academy and teach it down in a fire academy. You know, if you teach it here, go to fire engineering seminars, go to firehouse expo, teach it there. They're looking for experts. And this job is getting more and more complex. Car fires or something you could really explore. I'm still waiting for the EMS expert. You know, I'm still waiting for that guy. You know, I think Dan Potter is the guy going to write that book about, you know, responding as an, an ambulance uh, person. And as a firefighter. So we now do medical emergencies and we do firefighting. I'm waiting for that expert to, to capture us with uh, uh, medical medical triage emergency service. So become an expert. That's what I'm saying. Study, become an expert in one okay. field and leave the job better than it was when you came in. Hey, right. there it is. I'm going to well, be uh, an expert in the... Uh, the snowplow, uh, the FDNY snowplow. Did you see that that rig? <laughs> no. <laughs> there was there was a rig that I just saw on on uh, it was on social media, but I remember guys used to talking about that when I first got on the job. Right, they were talking about ah, pretty soon we're gonna have snowplows on the rig. Sure, shit, yeah, they had a rig right. with a snowplow on it. <laughs> I, I, I did see that. I did. Did you see, see that, that, Chief? Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Pretty funny That's stuff. Awesome. I don't know what the hell it was, but. <sighs> All right, so we have unfortunately one shout out to, to do tonight, Pete and uh, Roof. Yeah. I think you got this right, Chief. Just hang loose. We're just uh, we're going to go through the gonna... end here, and then uh, we'll we'll uh, get you when we're off uh, the live okay. show. Did you did you see that? You know, you're talking about role models. I just saw a kid's name go on there, Tyrone Finhold. You know, he's the chief of a fire of, of a Pine Hall Fire Department in New Jersey. That kid was a buck, 10 or 12 years old up in Harlem, in the, running the streets of Harlem with Lionel Horry, his buddy. And we would see him at fires. So he became enamored with the fire service. I sure has some role models in the fire service. He's now the chief of department of the Pine Hall Fire Department. So here's a kid, got out of the streets, of, the tough streets of Harlem, and he's the chief of a department. Good day for him. That's awesome. Yeah. Good story. Okay, Ruff. Ruffy. Yeah, so this was a picture. Uh, we had, uh, unfortunately, line of duty death. This was a picture, uh, I believe, Paulie Zara. I think he's a lieutenant there. Um, he, sent, uh, he sent this picture. So this was... Um, uh, let me see here. Yeah, you have his name there, Coops. I don't. Ha I just lost the screen here. Hold on. You have it there, Petey. I'm looking for it. I just sir. had it here. I'm sorry, guys. 
stand by. Okay. Um, well, I don't have the name. I know that he's in 134. Jess, Jess Gerard. Gerard? Jess Gerard. So he just passed away. Uh, they had a job in uh, from 134 truck, and uh, they just had a job, and he passed away two days later. I or believe a day he, later. Lives in, he lives in my neighborhood in Long Beach. Yes, he's in Long, in Long Beach. Beach. Yep. So line of duty death. We're going to give him the five bells for a line of duty death, brother. Rest in peace, brother. All right, Ruffy. Chief, thank you. Great show. We're going to actually have the date book out. We're going to grab him for the second part before we let him go uh, uh, after the, the post show. Uh, so we'll get that out ASAP. Uh, Twenty one on the twenty first, we got Louis Cousin. Oh, my cousin! He was a captain in Yonkers. Did twenty yep. twenty three years from. Yep. I think he got in the early sixties as well. So uh, a lot of funny stuff. He's gonna have some stories about my old man and all that good stuff. Nice. So it should be funny. Yeah. And then uh, February twenty eighth, we have Chief John Norman coming on February twenty eighth. Look forward to it. Never, Never heard. Of him. Wrote a great book. Excellent book. <laughs> All trip. right, Petey. <laughs> um, all right, guys. Very quickly, uh, you guys all know the deal. This uh, this is also an audio podcast on iTunes Podcast, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever find audio podcasts are found. But if you're here at YouTube.com forward slash Getting Salty Experience, guys, hit that like button. Hit it. Just hit it now. You're watching. Hit it. No big deal. Maybe hit the subscribe button while you're at it and share this sucker. So we can get it out there and get a lot more people on the show, more entertainment for you, more events, more uh, shows. Let's make this a five day a week thing. What do you say? Oh, All like right, it. head on over to Instagram if you're there at Salty Dog Inc., where Mr. Refredo curates the finest, saltiest fire photos <laughs> in the game. Guys, uh, you can support us and support the show, but really support yourself with some cool swag. Uh, from gettingsaltyapparel.com. That's how we pay the bills around here and keep the lights on. Also, thank you to everyone who hooked us up in a super chat tonight. Guys, that was really great. We really, really, really appreciate it. Uh, you guys are our number one sponsors and number one syndicators, as I always say. Uh, Facebook, guys, Getting Salty Fans page. We're past 30,000 members now, uh, which... I love, but also pisses me off because you got 30,000 on Facebook and what, 25, 26 on uh, yeah, YouTube? Yeah, how, how does that math add up? I don't how know. How does that compute? We're missing 5,000 here. So get your filthy, grubby paws out and hit the like, subscribe, and share button. Um, if you guys have a question uh, for the show, shoot it to getting salty experience at gmail.com. And guys, uh, for our cup of Joe and Fuego or uh, cocklofts and cocktail show, shoot your helmet cam footage, uh, fire photos, rig photos, tables, mustache photos, uh, hot old lady pics to Coob's podcast at gmail.com. And that is all the news. That's Chief, what is awesome. your uh, your Facebook, uh, the battle uh, ship? What is uh, the battle? Vincent, uh, Dun Vincent Dunn's fire battle space. Battle, battle space. space. All right, I'm going gonna, gonna to put it in the link on the, uh, yeah. on the show. And also... Yeah. If they wanted to buy your past books, um, where did they do that? Is that vinnydon.com? Is that no, it's it's FDNY Pro P R O dot org forward slash books. That's F D N Y Pro P R O. I got it, Chief. Org. Yep. I'm going to put that in the uh, the link. It's a link. Uh, it's like a link. And then the, the, the Fire Foundation sells them. Okay, very good. Awesome. And we're going to try to rope uh, the chief in. Oh, it looks like I have next Thursday open. But we'll talk about him in a post show. <laughs> yeah. You gotta, you gotta, I got I to gotta look at my calendar. He's got to come oh, on. Guys, oh, he's got commitment. All right, we'll get him. We'll get him. We'll get him. Right. So you'll get me. You know, I promise. I promise. But All I got to right. look at my calendar. All right, we had a great time. Uh, guys, don't forget about the uh, Getting Salty Florida Beach Party. Uh, reach out to Jose on Facebook. And that's all I got. All right. All right. We'll see you guys. Chief, on, it was uh, an absolute Monday. pleasure. Hold really on. Don't incredible. go anywhere, Chief. Don't go anywhere. We get you on okay. the uh, post show.
All right, okay. guys. We'll see you uh, Monday night. Uh, stay low and go. All right, everybody. We'll see you at the big one. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>